Good morning. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the fourth edition of the Shine English Teaching Conference. We at Twinkle Star are very happy to be your hosts this year as well. As many of you probably know, Twinkle Star is the biggest Cambridge Preparation Center in Romania, and we are also an examination center. Uh, we take great pride in what we have achieved so far, as we've got more than 15 years of experience. And today's event is one of the things that, uh, or one of the, uh, the achievements that brings us a lot of joy. The conference debuted uh, during the pandemic. That's when we had the first edition of the conference. And it was born out of our wish to be of help to all English teachers uh, throughout the country and why not uh, throughout the world uh, during challenging times, to be there for them during challenging times. And uh, here we are today at, our, at its fourth edition. So we started then. And here we are today, uh, four years later, with its fourth edition. We hope that you'll enjoy the content that we have strived to bring forward to you today. We thank you for having chosen to spend your day with us and to learn alongside us. Uh, what's new this year is that we'll communicate via Zoom, uh, but also we are streaming live on Facebook and on YouTube. So. Good morning to everyone watching, both on uh, Zoom, uh, on Facebook, and on YouTube uh, alike. Uh, this being said, uh, let the learning begin, because we've got um, so many great speakers today with so many things so that, the, with so many interesting things that they'll, they'll share with us that I don't want to postpone the learning experience anymore. Uh, so uh, let's introduce uh, this year's first speaker, it's um, our dear Aniela Bushile. She has been one of the pillars of, uh, of this conference from its very beginning, one of its supporters from the very first edition. And here we are today, Aniela, <laughs> fourth edition, still together. Uh, she's a teacher and a teacher trainer and has been a Cambridge educational consultant since 2009. She's got extensive uh, experience of Cambridge English exams and has prepared students and teachers alike for the full range of uh, Cambridge English uh, qualifications. She holds a degree in languages and TK, TKT, SLP, SLTS, and SELTA teaching qualifications. So we've got a lot to learn from Aniela. Thank you very much, Aniela, for being here with us today. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, it's always great pleasure and honor to participate in your SHINE conference. I feel like SHINE, you know, um, together with our dear colleagues in Romania and not only, because I know that the conference has been attended by many teachers uh, that come from different countries, not only from uh, Romania. Because you mentioned CELTES and CELTP, um, I, I, I can't help it, I need to, to remember you know the great times when uh, i was preparing for these degrees with twinkle star um as a, as an authorized center so um Dara, what i would like to add and be, because per, perhaps you you started modest as usual is the fact that um twinkle star has also been a Gold Preparation Center, Cambridge Gold Preparation Center for many years now. So every year you're growing, every year um, you keep the, the healthy approach of step by step. Um, and I would like to congratulate you on uh, behalf of Cambridge um, for all your great effort, dedication, professionalism, and last but not least, for your care for all not only your teachers or not only the teachers in Romania. So thank you very much. Congratulations. And of course, um, success, a lot of success. Um, good luck, success, prosperity, money, students, Cambridge books and Cambridge exams, dear teachers, are also the things that I wish you in the new calendar year. And I hope that um, you understand uh, during my presentation, at the end of my presentation, that Cambridge is here to help you get all these things, including love, because everything is um, with love here. Now, my presentation is going to present uh, Cambridge, 
but in a let's say in a way that you can use it um in your classrooms or when you talk to parents then i'm going to um to tell everybody how to become a cambridge preparation center especially now that our host is a uh, twinkle star and authorized exam center um i strongly recommend taking this opportunity and asking for whatever information you need to become a Cambridge preparation center then i'm going to introduce some new resources <clears throat> may they be books or um free of charge resources on cambridgeenglish.org and at the end i'll also introduce our initiative we can do better than photocopying so let's start um not very new anyways <laughs> anymore cambridge is now the place where our world's non-native speakers world grows and that's primarily because cambridge assessment the the, the exam department um <clears throat> got united with cambridge university press in 2022 and now with Cambridge University Press and Assessment, something that everybody had been waiting for, of course, and we believe we're stronger to support you, dear teachers, your students, and of course, their parents. So now we are, um, I, I am going actually to, to present to you, especially to new teachers, uh, our exams. We've got exams from pre-A1 to C2, uh, the official preparation materials that both can be found on cambridgeenglish.org again to support teachers, candidates, and parents. Now, this is our motto, and I'd like you to take a, a minute and read it because it's our um, our mission. And I believe your students should know it, and their parents too. So just take a couple of seconds to read what we believe and what we do. <clears throat> because you're attending this conference, I'm pretty sure that you can mirror your own professional destinies into our um, mission statement. Now, the next part of my presentation will be in Romanian. Yes, because after uh, the event, I will send you the, the, my presentation and you can use the slides in your classrooms and you can use the slides when you talk to parents. Perhaps you, you may organize, let's say, more easily nowadays, uh, meetings with your parents online. And if you want, I can also participate in your, um, in your meetings. So first of all, parents, and students and new teachers know who we are. Uh, we're part of the University of Cambridge. We're a non-for-profit organization, which means that all the profit goes back into research and um, making sure that this world becomes a better place uh, for all the <coughs> world citizens by improving our English and our way of communicating everything we know, everything we want in English. Um, <clears throat> we've got more than 110 years of experience in assessment. The first exam was launched in 1913. It was C2 proficiency. But of course, alongside with the assessment, we've always invested in um, research into uh, how to teach, how to learn, <clears throat> and how to use, I'm sorry, um, and how to use uh, English. Now, Parents, teach, uh, teachers and students should also know that we've got more than 2,800 exam centers in 130 countries, more than 52,000 preparation centers. Today, our host uh, somehow builds up these numbers, both numbers, because they are both an authorized exam center and uh, a gold preparation center in Romania. Uh, our certificates are recognized by more than 25,000 uh, institutions in the world, universities, companies, uh, ministries. And what's really important is that we, <clears throat> uh, we reflect the quality of our work in numbers. And we've got 5.5 million qualifications and tests every year. More than 55,000 uh, schools use our qualifications. These are things the students don't know. 
and parents don't know. But if you tell them, it will be easier for you to explain why you you expect um, high standards when it comes to learning, because you also offer high standards when it comes to, uh, to teaching uh, with us, Cambridge. Now, um, <clears throat> it's not a secret that we've got exams for the entire CFR because we contributed to the elaboration of the CFR uh, in the 90s. Uh, we've got also a test for very young learners, pre-A1 started, that is um, at the beginning of the CFR. And that's why um, this test is the only Cambridge test that is, hasn't been recognized by the Ministry of Education in Romania. About the recognition a bit later in my presentation. Now, um, other important things that uh, students and parents should know. They should know that their CFR that has become global, a global tool, a global tool of um, gauging the, the uh, linguistic competencies uh, of everybody uh, in this world. We've got the exams that are perfectly mapped and we also have the Cambridge English Scale. Cambridge English Scale was launched in 2015 because we wanted to be even more precise in reporting your students' results, your, our candidates' results, so that you know very well what to do next. Because our approach has always been a step-by-step -step approach, a gradual process of learning, teaching, and of course, um, these two processes should always um, uh, should always um, be finalized in assessment, in getting the certificates, the desired, most wanted certificates. Now, it's also important for students to know, and for you um, teachers to know, that success in learning will always come with motivation, confidence, fun, clear objectives, accurate content and accurate level and plenty of practice. Well, Cambridge makes sure that everything is included in our books and in all the guidelines that we've created to help teachers and their students. So we always um, rely on the way we motivate candidates to prepare for exams, but also to participate in the exams. Uh, we are trustworthy. We offer um, people confidence while preparing for Cambridge exams. Uh, lessons, I know that you know how to make your lessons entertaining. Please, if you haven't, um, if you haven't, open the Cambridge book so far, do that. Maybe today we offer e, three e-samples online. So open a Cambridge book and you'll find plenty of fun and very clear objectives, the right level for your students and plenty of exercise. When it comes to certificates <clears throat> that follow the exams, it's crucial for certificates to be recognized. Our students, especially in Romania, um, make huge efforts to, to study English, to learn English, to perfect their English. You also support them every step of the way, just like us. But without the recognition of the process of learning and process of teaching, we sometimes can't pick up our results. It's like you sow a lot of seeds and you can never crop it because you don't have the official international certificate. So my presentation today is uh, is meant for you to, to get the confidence to talk to students and their parents to prepare for Cambridge exams and to get their certificates. Now, <clears throat> as I've told you already, more than 25 institutions globally recognize our uh, certificates. Um, if you're interested, you can use a very user-friendly search engine where you can set the country, you set the exam or the level, and you get a full list of institutions recognizing that thing. Uh, when it comes to the recognition in Romania, things are very clear um, for, for this year. What I would like to underline before I show you the recognition is the fact that the recognition law gets updated every year and that we cannot talk about recognition uh, for the lifetime. We talk about for the recognition of 
school year. So I'm now introducing the recognition in Romania for the, the school year 2023-2024. Um, A1 movers, A2 pliers have been recognized to replace the exam uh, that usually grants students access to intensive classes in the fifth grade. And they've been recognized for many years now, I believe more than 10 years, provided that students get a certificate, including 11 shields with this structure, four shields in one paper, four shields in another paper, and three in the third paper, in the third part of the exam. Then um, all certificates, all Cambridge certificates indicating A2 <coughs> are to replace the test that usually uh, that students usually take in the eighth grade to study in a bilingual or intensive um, class in the ninth grade, the secondary school. <clears throat> and when it comes to baccalaureate, all certificates, including B1 preliminary, are to be um, considered to, to, to help students get exempted from the baccalaureate exams provided that they obtain grades A, B, O, C. Um, now, the feedback that I've always got from teachers is that, how oh, come on, B1 preliminary, uh, that's too low. Are you sure the ministry recognizes B1 preliminary? Yes, because the Romanian state can only issue um, certificates that, are, um, that um, certify B1 and B2. So Cambridge B1 preliminary, this exam, uh, followed up by the, the, the certificate with A, B or C, is good enough. If you've got questions, do not hesitate to, to contact me. My contact details will be in this presentation and I, you'll also be able to, to see them at the end of my presentation. <clears throat> now, when it comes to the academic recognition that we've got in Romania, these are only some examples of universities that recognize Cambridge certificates, just an, as an example, if you are a university professor and you want to uh, teach your, uh, your subject in English, you need a B2 first certificate. All in all, all students and their parents should know that certificate exams, sorry, exams have been designed um, to build on the skills developed at the previous level. So this is how we ensure the step-by-step approach. They're all reliable and consistent. They make learning and teaching fun, and they keep students motivated to perform at the highest standards. Last but not least, why should a, a, a student get all certificates when maybe they want only C1 advanced? Well, because nowadays the student's profile and later on CVs are always crucial will always be crucial um, when it comes to the student's destiny, um, all through the, the, the educational system and later on uh, in, the work, in the world of work. Um, it's really important for you teachers to believe in this, first of all. And after that, your students will follow you. If you don't believe that every certificate every Cambridge certificate, and not only Cambridge certificate, the IT certificates, other languages certificates. If you don't believe that every certificate will make your student's life better, you will not be um, easy to believe in front of uh, parents and when you talk to them. So first of all, you, you need to start to believe that every certificate builds their destiny. Yes, I know it's quite new. We used to believe that you need to be an adult in order to build your CV. No, now CVs, uh, profiles start being built when they are very, very young with young learners. This is a, a, a great moment for, you, for me to also discriminate between recognition and uh, expiry dates. A lot of people ask me, is that true that Cambridge uh, certificates expire? No, it's not true. They do not expire. There's uh, you, you can't see an expiry date on the certificates, but it's true that some institutions might restrict their rec uh, recognition to, let's say, two or three years. 
some institutions, but not all. And when you talk about the student's profile, every certificate means that that student and you, their teachers, have been able to get through a teaching learning process um, consistently, reliably, and you've got great results. So it's a sort of endorsement of your efforts and endorsement of their efforts as students and um, the recognition of their job. Now, <clears throat> I've also promised a couple of words about how to become a Cambridge Preparation Center. First of all, a Cambridge Preparation Center could be an institution or a teacher, a teacher that prepares candidates at home um, or in a private um, institution. So any institution or teacher prepares and enters candidates via an authorized exam center. Um, I'd like to remind you of the fact that Twinkle Star, our host today, is an authorized exam center. So if you're interested in becoming a Kimch Preparation Center, today is your day because you can be in, um, in touch with uh, our host. Uh, you can use the Q&A uh, um, in, in, in Zoom, but you can also write your questions in the chat. And of course, you can always contact uh, contact me if you need more information. What becoming a Kimpish Preparation Center? First of all, because we grant you a logo, this beautiful logo <clears throat> down on my screen. We prepare for Cambridge because you'll have access to more resources, to your students' results, to extra uh, free of charge sample papers. Because if you register, but this. All these come with one candidate, only one candidate you need to register in order to become a chemistry preparation center. But if you manage to do a bit better than this, and you and most of the teachers in Romania do that, and you can register more than um, 30 candidates in a school year, then you're granted a certificate, and that certificate will bring value to you as a professional, but also to the institution you work for, uh, which usually, off the record, gets extra points from the RRGP inspections. Um, for, for people that attend the conference from other countries, I might use some, some words that you're not familiar with, but they, they, are, um, they are dedicated to teachers in Romania and their schools in Romania. You'll also be granted the marketing materials, and you will be able to participate in our loyalty scheme programs, uh, Cambridge Preparation Center words, but you'll also be part of uh, the, the Twinkle Star loyalty um, scheme as well. You'll be in, let's say, more direct contact with us. So plenty of, plenty of reasons why you should become a Cambridge Preparation Center. However, a preparation center is not authorized because we will never come to, to check on you to see if you teach the right way or if you, no, we're not going to do that. We don't inspect, we don't authorize, we don't certify. We only say, yes, you've registered candidates, so it means that you've prepared them. So you're a Cambridge Preparation Center, but you're not authorized. So if there are teachers working for preparation center, Cambridge Preparation Centers, they, they notice that the way the center promotes includes something like authorized, certified, accredited by Cambridge, please ask your marketing colleagues to remove that because you cannot be authorized as a preparation center. You can be authorized if you are in the exam center, but in Romania, we're not going to certify or authorize exam centers for the next, let's say, 10 years. So as a preparation center, you should know that you're not authorized and you're not an exam center or a test center. What you can do instead is indeed to offer your school premises to Twinkle Star, for example, to come with assessors and with the exam papers and organize the exams at the school premises. But this doesn't make the school a test center or an exam center. This is really important because I don't want parents or students to um, not to have access to accurate information. The next part of my presentation, oh my God, I need to finish in five minutes, is related to new resources. We've got great books for teachers that um, that teach in kindergarten, so pre-primary, PIPA and POP. It's excellent. I'm not going to give you more details about it, but my presentation, my slides will include it. If you're curious, you can scroll down and you can also use the links to access the sample papers. We've got the second edition of Superminds, excellent book, uh, formidable book, 
um, is reported by teachers preparing candidates for young learner tests. <clears throat> Again, you can find plenty of information here and reasons why you should adopt that book. Prepay is also new, quite new to, to us, Romanian teachers. Um, it, it's a, a title that prepares one exam in two years, so one exam in two books for those, those teachers that don't have the luxury of seeing their students very often during the week. Again, plenty of information in my slides, but I don't have time to uh, to get through all the, um, the links right now. If you're interested in books, you can contact our distributors. Their contacts is in my presentation. The next three slides are um, a great collection of resources, free of charge resources for you, for, for uh, the school managers from um, help desk contact to exam preparation resources, uh, handbook for teachers, global recognition links, um, placement tests. Please do use the test your English link because that will give you the best image of your students at the beginning of the learning process. So you, you've got information in, in these three slides, you've got all the information about the free of charge resources that can help you in your process. The last thing I want to talk about is a wonderful initiative. We can do better than photocopying. It's, it's an initiative that we launched um, uh, last year in September. We want kids to get access to books on paper that were published by Cambridge. Um, because photocopying did us a lot of harm. Uh, when I talk to, uh, when I say us, it's our, we as teachers, um, when we didn't have access to books and there was, I, I don't know, for, for example, Jeremy Harmer, there were, were three copies available at the university. So we, we had to photocopy um, it because we couldn't find the books. But nowadays, books are here and books are beautiful and books are those that will give you teachers structure, credibility, and elegance and confidence in your teaching. Please don't try to make your own book out of a million books that um, you scan or photocopy one or two pages from. A book is holy because it's got that um, beautiful progression and content. Now, unfortunately, I don't. Uh, that, Dana, do you think I could just, you know, steal three minutes? Yes, go ahead, please. <laughs> Thank you. It's 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 for all the teachers. I want them to show the video that was created as a special dedication to this initiative. Thank you very much. <laughs> Titlul, desenele, culorile, îmi place și când e ușor de citit, când literele sunt mari. Totul e super la o carte. A, și îmi place și când e a mea. Cartea mea, exercițiile mele. Pot să citesc mai repede și mai eficient, adică, de exemplu, pot să-mi fac notițe. Îmi place mult să-mi fac temele direct pe carte. Nu știu ce aș făcut fără cărți în pandemie, când toată viața, practic, era online și dacă și cărțile erau online, nu puteam să mă concentrez atâta timp numai pe un ecran. Îmi place că economisesc timp. Cu cartea profesorului, de exemplu, e mai ușor să planific. Tot conținutul unui curs e perfect organizat și nu ai cum să greșești. N-am putut niciodată să folosesc fișe ca să predau un curs întreg. Sunt profesor de engleză, nu scriitor de programă. Ei sunt specialiști și ei știu cel mai bine. Am totul într-o carte, de fapt într-un pachet. Manualul cu ce am de predat, caietul de exerciții pentru teme și testele de progres pentru evaluare. Ușor de predat, ușor de recapitulat și verificat, ușor de folosit. Ei bine, în primul rând îmi place să o cumpăr și cumpăr câte două pentru că am gemene. Și mie și fetelor mele ne place foarte mult să vorbim despre cărțile pe care dorim să le cumpărăm și vreau să le fac să se îndrăgostească de cărți. Cel mai bun sfat de parenting pe care l-am auzit, fă ceea ce vrei ca și copilul tău să facă. Îmi place că nu pierd timpul ajutându-mi copilul să găsească fișe, 
teme, pe tot felul de foi, mini dosare, uneori profesorii folosesc doar fișe pentru toate materiile la școală și sunt chiar copleșită. Trebuie să le caut prin toată casa în fiecare seară. De asta pur și simplu iubesc cărțile de pregătire Cambridge. Un manual, un caie de exerciții, simplu, nu mai trebuie să caut nimic. Îmi place siguranța pe care cărțile Cambridge mi-o oferă. Conținutul este totdeauna actualizat, iar gramatica, vocabularul și competențele lingvistice sunt perfect adaptate examenelor pe care le pregătim. Tot ce avem nevoie e acolo. Apoi, eu am asociat mereu profesorul cu eleganța, delicatețea, pasiunea. Elevii văd aceste lucruri când profesorul intră în clasă cu un teanc de cărți și dicționare. Sunt sigură că văd exact opusul dacă intră în clasă cu un teanc de fișe boțite și pătate. I'm going to stop right here. I know I'm the first presenter. I don't want to to destroy all your agenda, but please, if you're curious, you can you can uh, can uh, you can see this uh, this video on uh, uh, our website and in my presentation. This is my contact. Do contact me if you're interested in anything related to Cambridge books and Cambridge exams. Thank you very much. If there are questions, I will just reply in the chat. Okay. Thank you very much, Aniela. For Thank the... you. And now, and, and now I, I believe Peter is uh, is waiting for his presentation. Yeah. Um, one, just one second, because we've talked about. Uh... Hello, Peter. Hi, Peter. Hi. So Hi. good to see you. Happy New Year, Peter. Yeah, same to all of you. Good morning, everybody. So, okay. Uh, because you have talked about um, <clears throat> Cambridge exams. Yeah. I've got to one second. I've got to uh, let the, let the, all the people attending know that we have got Cambridge exams in place all throughout the country, not just in uh, not just in Yash. Oh um, yeah. And um, one second, I'm trying to. I've got a, a tiny little technical problem up here apparently because we can hear you. We can see you. Okay. Anyways, uh, I will share information um, in the follow-up email about exam sessions that we've got all throughout the country. So if anyone, if any of uh, the people attending would like to register candidates for Cambridge exams and don't know how to do that, maybe one of the one of the one of the places we have exams in is in their proximity, and they can register candidates there. So. Um, To everyone here, uh, we will send out a follow-up email and we'll include information about Cambridge uh, uh, sessions there. And also my colleague will put the link to our exams um, um, website in the chat box immediately so you can consult it and see where exactly we've got sessions and where you can register uh, participants. Thank you very much once again, Aniela. My pleasure always. Good luck. Good luck. Thank you, Peter. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much. I appreciate it a lot. And welcome, Peter. Um, so as you can see, our next speaker, he's a Cambridge representative as well. He has got uh, he has had a long career in English language teaching, teacher training and management in Europe and the Middle East. And if I'm not mistaken, you're now based in Cyprus, Peter. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. He's the author and co-author of a range of popular course books. So maybe some of the books we've used with our students have been uh, have been co-authored by the Peter, um, and um, including Cambridge IGCSE English as a second language, Introduction to English as, as a second language, both published by Cambridge University Press. He's also the co-author of From Teacher to Trainer with Matthew T. Elman, and he is a professional learning and development manager for Cambridge University. Press. Once again, thank you, Peter, for being here with us today. You're welcome. It's lovely to see you. And uh, hi to everybody who's joining us today. Um, I've just got a little problem with my video. Not with my video, with my camera. Just give me a second. I think that should be correct now. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Hi, everybody. I think there's, goodness me, nearly 300 people here. 
Um, I hope it's going to be a, a useful 60 minutes with me. Uh, I'm not going to talk about books. I'm not going to talk uh, specifically about um, methodology. I'm going to be talking about you. I'm going to be talking about you, the teachers. Um, for me, teachers are the most important people um, in, the, in the classroom. I know we think the students are, but I think the teachers are. So we're going to talk this morning um, about you and your about teacher learning, not so much about student learning, but today we're going to talk about uh, teacher learning. Just before we begin, um, I'd like to show you uh, this QR code. Um, if you'd like to receive uh, information from us, uh, teacher resources for free, um, information about events and webinars for free, uh, information about exam preparation centers, as Aniela has just been talking about, please use the QR code um, and there'll be a form for you to fill in, uh, which will enable us to uh, contact you uh, with all the relevant information. Okay, so let's get started. As you've heard, uh, my name is Peter Lucantoni. That's Italian. My dad was Italian. My mum is English. I was born in the UK. I was educated there, uh, but I haven't lived in the UK uh, for about 40 years now. Uh, I've lived in uh, Europe and the Middle East, uh, and now I'm based uh, in Cyprus. And I'm the professional learning and development manager for Cambridge University Press uh, and Assessment. Uh, as you heard, uh, I'm also an author. Um, I've written books for students, for example, uh, IGCSE, English as a Second Language. Uh, but last year I published with my uh, very good friend and colleague, Matt Elman, uh, a book called From Teacher to Trainer, which is a book for um, a handbook for teachers, if you like, uh, who are moving into the role um, of, of teacher trainer. So what we're going to cover today um, is the following points. We're going to have a think, first of all, about what's the point of teacher learning? What are we aiming for with teacher learning? And we're going to talk about uh, impact and the importance uh, of impact in what we do um, as both uh, trainers and teachers. We're going to look at how the process of developing teacher learning actually takes place. And we're going to look at how we can actually implement uh, teacher learning, and there'll be an opportunity uh, for uh, a summary as well. Um, I hope I'm going to be able to make this interactive. It's difficult with 300 people, um, but we do have the chat box. So I hope when I ask questions, um, you'll be able to type some answers into the chat box. So let's begin with a question. And in fact, it's a question which you don't need to answer. Uh, you can if you want, but you don't need to answer it. It's just a sort of a reflection question. I want you to think about yourselves and decide if you are A, B or C. And it doesn't matter if you're A, B or C, but it's just to get you thinking about where you are at the moment uh, in terms of your teacher learning and your teacher development. So are you a teacher? who manages your own development. And if you've decided to attend th this, uh, this event today, then possibly you're A. Um, are you somebody who's responsible for teacher learning? Are you a trainer or are you a head of department? Are you a coordinator? That would make you B. Or maybe you're neither A or B and you're, you're somebody completely different. So that would make you C. So as I say, you don't need to answer, but just think Am I an A, a B, or a C? And try and keep that in mind as we go through uh, the rest of the presentation. I'm just going to have a quick look at the chat box. And yes, people are responding. Um, yeah, we've got lots of yeah, lots of A's coming in. Okay, but as I say, you, you don't need to answer. It's really just a thinking question. Uh, there's a couple of B's coming in as well. Okay, great. So let's look at our first question, which is what are we aiming for in teacher learning? What's the point of teacher learning? Now, this time, I do want you to answer. So very quickly in the chat box, any quick responses to the question, what are we aiming for in teacher learning? What are we aiming for in teacher learning? If you prefer teacher development or, or, or teacher training, what's the aim of it? Yes, Irina says to improve our skills. Nice first answer. Good. Uh, Michaela says exactly the same. Good. We all agree to improve our skills. Anything else? That's nice from Laura. Yeah, to develop our competencies. Yeah. And Catalina says when a teacher learns something new, he or she can learn something. Yeah, very, very good. There's a connection there with, uh, with our students as well. Uh, maintaining skills, high level, competencies, knowledge, new methods, improvement. Yeah, brilliant. Brilliant. 
Yep. Lovely, lovely. Okay, I'm being asked to share the screen again. Don't quite know how to do that. Okay, stop share. Let me try again. Share sound. PowerPoint slideshow. Share. Okay, is that better? Is that okay now? Um, no, Peter, I, I think what we see is um, the presenter mode. Okay. Let me try you, you need to, to, to share the slide. Ah, oh, no, it's great. Thank you. Okay. Perfect. Yeah, okay. excellent. Thank you. Um, right. Thank you for all those answers. I'll just have a quick look for a couple more. Put ourselves in students' shoes. Brilliant. Okay. Let's have a look at a quote. Have a look at this. I think this is a superb quote because I think it makes the point that, um, or, or it, it removes the negativity in the word improvement. I think when we hear the need, the, hear the word teachers need to improve, we 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 think about negativity. Uh, when we say to students, you need to improve, I think it has it has quite a negative connotation. But of course, improvement is not suggesting that you're no good. Improvement is suggesting, as Dillian Williams says. It's not about you're not being good enough or you're not doing well enough uh, or you're lazy. It's because we can always be even better. And I think that's the key to teacher learning and indeed to student learning is that everybody needs to improve, not because you're no good, not because you're doing things in a, in a, in a bad way, but because everybody can be even better and nobody is excluded from that. So. What are the missing words? One, two, three, and four. Quickly in the chat box. What are the missing words? Sustained what in teaching knowledge and practice? This is what we're aiming for in teacher learning. We want sustained what? What's number one? Begins with the letter I. Sustained what in teaching knowledge and practice? Uh, Roxana says interest. Yeah, okay. Independence, I like that, Alina. Yeah, interest, independence. Yeah, yeah, interactivity. Yeah, I haven't seen the right word yet. Okay, the second letter is M. M for mother. No, M. M, 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 M. Impact, improvement. Okay, I think we've got it. Well done. Okay, so the first one is improvement. In fact, it's improvements. So what are we aiming for in teacher learning? The first thing that we're aiming for is sustained improvements in teaching knowledge and practice. Now, sustained means over a period of time, doesn't it? So it's not just a one-off. We want these uh, improvements uh, to, to continue over a period of time. What about the second bullet? Something that are context sensitive. Andra says context, uh, Alina says contents. Andrea says cues, let's have a look. It's actually changes, yeah? So teacher learning is all about making changes in the classroom. So we need to make changes that are sensitive to the context that we're actually working in. Now, I'm sure you've attended many um, uh, teacher learning events like today, uh, workshops and webinars, uh, and you've seen some really great ideas, but then you've said to yourself, yeah, it's a great idea, but it's no good in my context. It's not going to work uh, in my context. So in teacher learning, we want to provide teachers with the possibility to change, uh, which will actually work um, in their uh, context. And the third bullet, positive what on student what? Uh, Diana says, uh, impact on student learning. Let's have a look. Yeah, positive impact on student learning. In other words, whatever happens in a webinar, whatever happens in a workshop, we want the teacher to take that and use it in the classroom so it has a positive impact on student learning. So what do we mean by impact? Well, I think impact is the end of the road, if you like, um, in uh, or, or towards the end of the road uh, in this whole process um, of, uh, of of teacher learning. I think we begin with input, 
And that's what we're having today. The whole of today's event is about input, providing teachers with knowledge, providing teachers with information, uh, providing uh, teachers with new ideas and strategies and theories and, me and methodologies. Uh, this is what um, input uh, actually means. But if that input is not implemented, then there can't be any impact. So once today finishes, once you go home, once you start planning for your lessons, if you decide not to take anything from today, if you decide not to implement anything from today, then there's going to be no impact when you go back into the classroom. However, if you do take something away from today, if you do learn something new from today's input, if you get a new idea or have a better understanding of something, um, then you can make a decision to actually implement it. And then this will be um, uh, the impact that you have uh, in the classroom. So what do we mean by impact then? Well, a few ideas in the chat box, um, but basically um, uh, the research tells us, Richardson and Maggioli say that the main goal of CPD, continuing professional development or teacher learning or teacher development, teacher training, whatever you wish to call it, the main goal is to effect changes in teaching so that it results in enhanced student learning. So we want changes in what teachers are doing so that there are changes in student learning and the student learning is enhanced. Because if that doesn't happen, then there's no point. There's no point in trying to effect uh, teacher learning if there's no uh, change in student learning. And Martin Parrott says this, So the goal of teacher education should be more effective learning of English or maths or geography. It doesn't matter what the subject is, but the whole point um, of, of teacher education, uh, the whole um, way in which we get this impact or, or, or how we realize the impact is by more effective learning of English uh, by pupils and students. I'm going to show you a very short video uh, produced by Cambridge. Uh, the video doesn't mention any Cambridge books. It doesn't mention any uh, Cambridge qualifications, exams, but what it does mention is impact. So what I'd like you to do is to watch this very short uh, video. And as you watch, have a think about the question on the left-hand side of your screen. What moments remind the teachers of their impact and the reasons that they became a teacher. Now, it's only a very short video, so you need to be focused uh, right from the beginning. But just think about the, the moments that, the, that remind the teachers um, of uh, impact. Um, I hope the sound's going to work. If not, please tell me quickly and I can adjust things. OK, here we go. Teaching English is not always easy. Some days can be hard. But then there are those moments that remind me of my impact and why I became a teacher. Watching them succeed is just the most incredible feeling. That feeling when they overcome their fear of speaking English. That feeling when they accomplish their goals. That feeling when they take the time to say thank you feeling when your world grows. Cambridge is where your world grows. Okay, so we've got four, I think, uh, very clear examples there of teachers talking about impact. So very quickly in the chat box, what were the four um, examples of impact that, that we got? The first one was about success, wasn't it? Somebody opening the envelope with their uh, results in. Uh, Laura says it was very emotional. Yeah, it was. Yeah, good. But what were the other examples? Yes, getting over fears. Good, Nicoletta. Yeah, yeah. Overcoming their fear of speaking. Yeah. Accomplishing goals. Brilliant. Good. Yeah. Passing an exam. Good. Another indication of uh, of impact, and probably the one that we we don't think of uh, very often is 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 when students are actually grateful um, for uh, the impact that we've had uh, on 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 their learning. Okay, great. 
So let's have a look at this whole process then. What, what do we need uh, in order for um, uh, teacher learning to actually develop uh, over a period of time? And I think there are four main things that we need, four ingredients, if you like, uh, that we need um, for teacher learning to actually uh, be able to develop. I think the first thing is that um, there needs to be a joint decision on aims. In other words, many people need to be involved in decisions about what the teacher learning is actually going to be. Now, earlier at the beginning of this session, I asked you, are you an A, a B or a C? Um, now, probably if you're a teacher, and you're here today, you made a conscious decision to attend today. Now, when you're at school or university or wherever you work, you may not have um, uh, the ability to make decisions about teacher learning. You may be told there's a workshop on Wednesday at three o'clock, you have to be there. So you're not actually involved in the decision, but today you did make a conscious decision to actually be here. So when I'm talking about decisions on, on aims, um, yes, it's about who decides, but it's also about what? What do I need as a teacher? Who knows best what I need as a teacher in order to become more effective, in order to have more impact uh, in the classroom? And why am I doing it? Is it just for the classroom impact or is there another reason why uh, I want to uh, attend this, this particular workshop? Maybe I'm um, uh, doing a, a, a teacher training course. Maybe I'm doing Cambridge CELTA or Cambridge DELTA and I need some more information on this or on that. And of course, who decides? Because let's remember that ultimately, and it's the same for our students, learning cannot be forced. If you're being forced uh, to attend a workshop, um, you know, the chances of it having actually any real impact on you um, is, 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 is going to be quite small. Um, if you make the decision for yourself, if the motivation is more intrinsic than extrinsic, then it's much more likely that there'll be an, there'll be, um, an impact on you. Um, you will want to implement and therefore there'll be uh, impact in the classroom. So the first thing is there needs to be joint decisions on aims. Teachers need to be involved uh, in making those uh, decisions. The second thing, and we've already sort of mentioned this, is there has to be a, a plan, a plan of action. And the plan of action needs to extend uh, over a period of time. It's not always possible. And of course, it is OK if we do things short term. But if we can take things over a period of time, uh, and make sure that things are happening regularly, then the teacher learning is likely to be much, much more uh, impactful. And uh, the research supports this. Have a look at this. So the research is telling us that when teacher learning is extended or prolonged over a period of time, it's more effective than shorter ones. And this particular piece of research um, mentions two terms or, or, or two school semesters, even a year, and in some cases, even multiple years. So if we can extend our teacher learning over a period of time, then it's much, much more likely um, to be of use. The third element within this uh, process of developing teacher learning is that we need um, the right environment and what we mean by the right environment is that there needs it needs to be a positive one and it needs to be a supportive one in other words wherever it is that you're working the uh, the management um, your heads of department your coordinators the head teacher whoever it might be uh, they need to create an environment within which um, there's positivity and there's support for teachers in their um, in their learning journey. Um, if teachers request, you know, time off to attend something, I know it's not always possible, but but you know, management should be uh, sympathetic to requests from teachers to do these types of things. So this positive and, and supportive environment, there needs to be some sort of order and structure and 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 discipline uh, between all of the members within that. Um, in, in, in environment so that teachers can see that there is a possibility um, to develop their, their, their teacher learning. There needs to be collaboration between teachers. 
Teachers need to talk to each other. Teachers need to support each other. Teachers need to observe each other um, if, if, if possible, because all of this collaboration creates a more positive and a more supportive uh, environment. The leaders, if it's the head teacher or the head of year or, or whoever it might be, um, needs to listen to teachers, needs to listen to teachers' concerns and needs to uh, support teachers. I'm, I'm sure that does happen in, in your uh, context, but far too often I hear that uh, leadership is not um, supportive and doesn't listen to teachers. We need within the environment, within the school, within the university, the college, wherever it is that you're working, we need to provide teachers with professional development opportunities. Obviously, today is one. And I, I, I was listening to Aniela towards the end of hers, uh, of, of her uh, talk, and she mentioned uh, opportunities to uh, attend events. Um, so we need to make teachers aware of all of these things. We're not saying that, you know, you should be attending everything, but you should have a, a menu, if you like, of different professional development opportunities so that you can pick and choose the ones which are particularly right for you. And bringing all of this together, of course, is that we need um, we need trust and we need respect between all the people uh, in the environment. OK, and then the fourth thing is that we need to think uh, about the input. What is the input? What is the input that's going to help teacher learning to develop? Because obviously not all input is, is correct. You, you know from your experience that you may attend a conference, you may uh, attend a workshop, um, but it may not be particularly useful for you um, in, in your context. Maybe the subject is okay, but maybe the way the content is delivered to you, the way the input is delivered to you um, is not particularly useful uh, or relevant. Now, at the start, I mentioned uh, the book that I co-wrote with, um, with Matt Elman from Teacher to Trainer. And in our book, we um, identify three um, elements that a successful teacher training input actually needs. And we call these uh, practical elements. We call them personal elements and we call them professional elements. So I just want to have a quick look um, at what these things mean so that you can get an understanding um, of what successful teacher training input uh, should look like. So looking at the practical side, um, on the practical side, we obviously need classrooms and we obviously need students. And it's very important within um, teacher learning, within uh, any, any um, uh, type of teacher learning that you're doing, that there's always a connection between the classroom, because the classroom is basically where you're going to go back to. It doesn't matter how much professional learning or teacher learning you're doing, ultimately, you're going to go back uh, to the to the classroom and to your students. So there needs to be a connection um, in uh, teacher training in, in the input um, with what you're ultimately going to go back to. And there are two ways that we can do this. The first way is that we can offer opportunities for teachers to notice teaching. So by noticing what's going on, you're watching, you're observing, you're taking notes, you're getting input from what you're actually observing. It's a bit like watching a, a craftsman or a, or a master at work. Uh, you get ideas um, about what you, you should be doing when you actually do it. So it could be... Um, observing a demonstration class. And this often happens on courses like Cambridge CELTA uh, and Cambridge Delta. You watch a class that somebody else is teaching um, and you learn uh, by watching. It could be that you watch something that your colleague is, is doing. <coughs> Excuse me. And I know that there are, there are always issues and problems <coughs> and constraints with watching colleagues in schools, which are always very busy and nobody has any time. But, but it doesn't have to be a whole lesson. It could just be a 15 or a 20 minute slot uh, in, in, in a lesson. Don't always think it has to be 40 minutes or, or, or 50 minutes. It could be just to go in and watch um, your colleague doing a particular activity or a strategy or, or using a new resource just for a, a 10, 15, 20 minute slot uh, in a lesson. And of course, there are plenty of opportunities nowadays uh, to watch things on, on, on video. So the practical side is opportunities to notice what goes on in classrooms and to learn from that. But also, of course, it's very important to practice teaching and you do it every day. Um, and if you've done a teaching qualification, you will have taught, um, um, uh, you will have done practice teaching. 
Um, but it could be micro teaching. You could be in a workshop, a, a live workshop, and the trainer might say to you in your groups, teach each other this particular piece of vocabulary or this structure or, or whatever it might be. Uh, I mentioned teaching practice, uh, but of course, you, you learn so much from your own class. And this is where the impact actually happens. This is where you implement uh, what you've learned and you take it into your own uh, classroom. So the first element is that we need a context. We need a classroom and we need uh, students. The second element is that we need uh, input, expert input. And this is what we call professional. So we've had the practical element and now we're looking at the uh, professional element. And what we mean here are things like terminology, all of the words and the phrases that we use to describe, you know, skills and productive and receptive and conditionals and, and all of those things. Anybody outside our profession would have no idea uh, what we were talking about. This is where also we look at research, we look at theories of learning, and we talk about teaching methodologies, as well as the insights that we get from research. And already this morning, I've showed you two or three quotes from the research, which supports what it is that I'm talking to you about today. So when we attend um, an opportunity for teacher learning, it's very important that there is a professional element uh, within uh, the workshop, within the teacher learning that you're attending, because it's very important as teachers that we see or we understand that the practical side is supported uh, by the theory, because this will help us as teachers to get the best results uh, for our learners. It will also help teachers to be able to access more resources uh, on your own. So after today, you'll be able to access more resources and develop further. And I've already offered you a QR code and Aniela told you to get in touch with her um, if you want to find out more and get more resources and so on and so forth. It also gives you as teachers an opportunity to contact other people um, and to learn from other professionals in different contexts, doing different things. I think it's very easy, isn't it, as a teacher to get, get into a little box um, and not see outside the box. Um, and I think through opportunities like today, um, you can learn about other contexts and what goes on in other contexts uh, and things that go on uh, in different perspectives. And I think the final thing to say here about why it's important to have that professional element um, is that it can help you to understand when you should be taking things from the input and considering the implementation and then um, hopefully getting some impact at the end. Where does the research come from? Well, of course, you get it from attending events like today, but also there are plenty of opportunities uh, to get free um, access to research. On the right of your screen, uh, the, the insights, uh, the assessment uh, research, uh, and the one over on the far right uh, from Cambridge International, all of these are free resources. So if you're interested in, in, in looking into things a bit more deeply, there are plenty of opportunities um, to, to access research uh, freely. The, the second one, um, teaching grammar for adults, um, this is just one example of the insight booklets, which are research based, but which, which also give you loads of practical ideas um, uh, for using in the classroom. And of course, over on the left, we've got books. Now, these are not free. Um, you, we have to pay for books. Um, and a, I've shown you the, uh, the cover of, of my book and another book off the page. But these are other ways where you can access research. And one other way to get free research, this is brilliant, Oasis, if you're interested. Um, in getting uh, research on a, on a regular basis. You just sign up for the OASIS uh, database, it's free, and they'll send you a monthly list um, of, of, of um, research into various areas. So if you're interested in reading skills, you just type in reading and it will give you all the research on reading and, and so on and so forth. Wonderful resource, wonderful. So we've had a quick look at the uh, practical and a quick look at the uh, professional. The third one is the personal, and this is where you really come into the uh, workshop. And it's very important in um, any uh, teacher learning opportunity that you're involved in, that the content um, is sensitive to your context and uh, its characteristics. So the training, the input 
if it's going to be successful, needs to be um, uh, sensitive to your particular teaching context. It's very important that the, the person delivering the input, delivering the training, is aware of what goes on in your particular context. And uh, that awareness will help them to make the input much, much more relevant uh, to you. Part of this also is about understanding you, the teacher, and understanding what your needs are and your beliefs are, your opinions and your ideas, because all of that helps uh, to shape the input uh, which is delivered. But the most important thing here, of course, is that if the input is sensitive to the context, then it makes it easier for the teacher to take the input and implement it in the classroom so that we have uh, impact. And just as a little example, um, we've got two um, different classrooms here on the left. Uh, we have um, a sort of a lecture style setup. And on the right, uh, we have a group work setup. Just very quickly um, in the chat box, just tell me, um, which is yours? Is yours on the left or yours on the right? Where you teach now, is it left or is it right? Left or right? Okay, lots of people saying right, 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 right. And Kodruta, I think I've pronounced your name correctly, is saying that number one is more teacher-centered and that number two on the right, I guess you mean, is more engaging. Uh, Trina says left, you're the only one. Ah, Vic Vic Victorita says left and right, Yonella left. Okay, so we're getting some lefts as well as rights. Okay, that's great. It's interesting to see that there is, ah, that's interesting, Irina, both, it depends on the situation. Yeah, uh, Eleanor also says both. The important thing, of course, is <clears throat> that most of the time, it's not in your control to change it. If you've got left, you have to deal with it. If you've got right, you have to deal with it. It's not uh, bad cop, good cop. It's not black and white. Um, they're contexts that we have to deal with as teachers and, of course, as, as teacher trainers as well. And each has its own uh, opportunities and each has its own uh, limitations. You could say on the left side of the screen, the lecture, that uh, more information can be um, passed over to students. On the right, you could say that there are more opportunities for, for pair work, but it doesn't mean that one is good and one is bad. It just means that there are different contexts and that um, the input that you're receiving from the trainer needs to be sensitive uh, to those particular different contexts. So we've looked at the three um, ingredients for impactful and for successful uh, teacher learning, the practical, the professional, and the personal. It doesn't matter um, in what order they appear uh, in the training. It doesn't matter how much of each one there is, but it's very important that the training, the input includes elements uh, of all three. So let me just give you a, a little example here. Um, Let's, let's, let's imagine that you are uh, attending a training session on uh, concept uh, checking uh, questions. And here's a very, very brief plan from the trainer. Um, can you tell me what the aims are for each of those three stages in this training plan? Remember, it's not a lesson plan for students. This is a training plan for teachers. So in the first stage, there's going to be a discussion about um, how many teachers already use CCQs um, and what are the circumstances and why. Then the trainer is going to explain why CCQs are so important and give some examples. And then thirdly, the teachers are going to work alone. So what are the aims of those three stages? I think I'll give you a quick clue for the first one. The, the aim of the first one is to find out what teachers already know. So what about numbers two and three? What's the aim, do you think? What's the aim of, of stage two? What are we? What's the trainer trying to achieve? Stage one, the trainer wants to find out what the teachers already know. And in the second one, what's the, what's the aim? Anybody want to be brave? No, nobody wants to be brave. Yeah. 
Anybody, 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 anybody? Why would a trainer do that with teachers? What, what's, the, what's the trainer trying to do? They're trying to help teachers what? Bodhruta says discovery, organization. Okay, what they can do. Okay, right, we're there, we're there. We're just about there, good. So the aim of the uh, second one is to help teachers understand the theory. Aniela says guided discovery. Yeah, finding out their needs, checking understanding. Okay, brilliant. What about the third one? What's the aim of the third stage? Teachers work alone to prepare some CCQs. What's the aim? Alina says practice. Yeah. Andrea says practice. I'll give you half a mark. I want a little bit more, just a little bit more. You're right, but just a little bit more. I'm going to have to tell you because I realize that time is um, not on my side. Control practice. Yeah, remember, it's not for students. This is for teachers. So it's not controlled practice because that, that's a, a term we use with, with students, isn't it? Practical teaching. Okay, we're nearly there. We're nearly there. So let teachers practice applying the theory. Okay, so for each stage of this training plan, there is an aim. Now what I want you to do is to tell me those three aims, are they personal, practical, or professional? Personal, practical, or professional? What about the first one? Is it personal? Is it practical? Or is it professional? Yonella says personal. Let's have a look. Absolutely right. Brilliant. Good. What about the second one? Explain why CCQs are so important. Explain why CCQs are so important. Number two, professional. Yeah, from Ramona, I think that was. Very, very good. And then, of course, the third one, where the teachers are working alone to prepare some CCQs, this is where we have our practical element. So we have our three Ps. We have the three Ps within uh, the training workshop, and each one has a very, very important part uh, to play. Okay, let's move on. So how do we do it? How do we actually implement this? Well, um, we need to look at the process. And I'd like to show you um, another very short video. Um, this is uh, Scott Thornbury, who I'm sure you've all heard of. I'm sure you've uh, read his books. <laughs> and in the video, he answers two questions. And the video is actually taken from the book that I wrote with Matt. Um, and we interviewed Scott and we asked him two questions. What did you find most effective in learning to teach? And um, uh, to what extent does that experience uh, influence the training that you now deliver to teachers? So have a, have a quick look and um, make a note of three activities that he says he found effective, three activities or, or, or three situations, and have a think about what he says about it, about each activity and how they've influenced um, his training now. Okay, here we go. There's no sound to begin with. The sound comes in a minute. I guess for me, the most effective developmental processes that I experienced as a, as a new teacher we're talking to other teachers in the teacher's room, um, asking questions, you know, how would you do this? How would you teach this unit in the book? Um, what's the past of must? <laughs> Things like that. So we had a very uh, mixed, in terms of experienced teacher's room, but we also had a very positive sharing kind of institutional uh, context. So I think that's, that got me through the first six months or a year, I guess. Um, and being observed uh, from time to time, I did, I do remember um, critical interventions by an observer or observers in terms of giving me feedback, which really pushed me to rethink uh, and to innovate in ways that uh, I might not have done just on my own. So I do think observation's useful. Um, 
what peer observation would have been useful too, but we just didn't have the means to do it. Uh, it was quite a while before I got any kind of formal developmental training in the, like an in-service course, for example. That was like at least five years after I uh, had started teaching. But of course, that, that was extraordinarily influential, uh, combined with the kind of reading that I started doing at that stage. Uh, so, you know, most of the, as I say, most of my experience was kind of classroom driven. And I think that's affected my teacher training too, to a large extent. I kind of really aim at the practical and the dialogic, you know? Talking about what you're doing in the classroom, what you've done, what you're going to do, doing it as a group, uh, and doing that as both in pre-service and in-service training, that it just seems to be the best possible way. Of course, coupled with observation, observation of videos, observation of real classes, but it's that sharing and collaborative planning and group feedback on lessons that uh, it's a great model uh, and it's classroom based. It's not theoretical, it's not book based, it's based on what happens and what the trainees experience in their own classes. Okay, I think that's great. I think he's covered pretty much everything that we've already been talking about this morning. But very quickly in the chat box, um, what particular activities did he mention? And I've only got five more minutes, everybody. So quickly, quickly, quickly. Uh, Laura says the teacher's room, peer learning. Yeah. Yeah. Asking questions, how would you do it? Peer learning again. Yeah. Being observed. Yes. Lovely. You've got some great ideas. And all the things that Scott said um, are the things that we've mentioned um, already today. OK, I, I, I hate to be a little bit rude, but I'm going to skip um, the the chat box because um, we, we, we really don't have a lot of time. I thought I had longer today, sorry. Um, okay, so Scott has already talked about how it works, but let's just remind ourselves that uh, we need input. Uh, we need input that then moves on to uh, implementation and then that moves on to uh, impact. And of course, input can, can happen in many ways. We've seen examples already and we've talked about uh, input in, in by watching teaching, by doing your own teaching. But of course, input also happens um, through uh, situations with teachers. You can see examples on the screen of things that I've uh, been doing over the years. So we need the input, first of all. And then, of course, the personal thing kicks in because as teachers, you need to make plans to implement changes in the classroom. You need to consider what's going to happen. When is it going to happen? What are the problems that, are going, that might come up in my particular context? And how am I going to solve those particular problems? And you may remember before the video, I asked you to uh, tell me what the aims of that training plan were for CCQs. So the impact that it might have on a teacher, a teacher who was in that particular session has decided now <coughs> that he's going to write CCQs in his lesson plan for the vocabulary he teaches. Rather than dealing with it on the spot, he's actually going to plan in his, um, in his lesson plan. The problem, of course, with doing that is that often words come up which you haven't um, anticipated. Um, so unplanned vocab comes up in class and the solution to that um, he's decided that he's going to ask uh, CCQs based on grammar of the vocabulary, which obviously he would know, uh, and then think about other CCQs, probably to do with meaning, uh, which he can check up on later. Then, of course, we need uh, more practical. So I've made this plan based on CCQs. Then I'm going to make changes uh, to my teaching as plan. And I'm going to uh, think about it over time because we've talked about sustaining things. So maybe a couple of weeks, maybe a month. And then I'm going to do it again and again. I'm going to try it with different classes in different levels with different types of students uh, to see how it works out. And then the final step here is, of course, that I need to check, has it worked? And how can I check? We'll look at that in a minute. But I need to use different checks to evaluate. And based on my checking, I need to make changes as necessary and then maybe go back uh, to more uh, practical issues. Um, how can I make those checks? Well, there are many ways that we can do this. Maybe I could get somebody, uh, a friend, a colleague, one of my peers to come in and observe me uh, and to uh, give me some uh, information. 
I can get feedback from my students. Maybe it could be done orally. Maybe it could be through a written form, maybe through exit tickets as students leave the lesson. We can ask them little questions or maybe when they come into the next lesson, you can ask them to reflect uh, on what they did previously. And of course, <laughs> we all have to look at students work. That's another way that you can do it. Right, I've got two, one minute and I have finished. So just very quickly uh, to summarize, you need to tell me what's hiding under the red uh, boxes. So the goal of what learning is better what learning? The goal of what learning is better what learning? Yeah, Justina, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the goal of teacher learning is better what learning? Begins with S. Ah, not sustained, no, student, yeah. So the goal of teacher learning is of course better student learning. For best what? Prepare the ground. Results, brilliant, well done, excellent. Very happy with those, those comments, excellent, good. Check for what as you what. Check for what as you what. It's an important word, we've had it a hundred times uh, this morning. Check for what as you what. Yes, Justina, brilliant. And she's written it in capital letters as well. Excellent, good. Yeah, check for input as you what. Uh, assess, yeah, Andrea. Yeah, it's not assess, but that, that's a possible word. It begins with P, P for Peter. Yes, uh, somebody got it there, didn't they? Sorry, I didn't see it in the chat. Andrea, thank you very much. And finally, allow time for what to consolidate? This is one word with two, two red bits. Long word. Three syllables. Ah, Ramona, nearly. It's actually improvements. Allow time for improvements um, to consolidate over a period of time. Okay, brilliant. Thank you so much for participating and for getting involved in the chat box. Um, this is just to show you I'm not talking a load of rubbish. It's all supported by uh, the uh, research. So thank you so much uh, for attending. I don't know if we've got time for questions. I suspect not. Um, but I'll just show you that QR code again. Um, scan it, fill in the form, and you can get access to free resources, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you for all your thank yous in the chat box. I really appreciate it. I hope it's been useful. Um, I think it's nice to talk about teachers for a change and not just about students. Thanks, everybody. Thank you very much, Peter, for the very useful information that you have shared with us today. It's been very entertaining. It's been very educate, educational and very entertaining at the same time. Thank you very, very much. You're welcome. Enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, next up. Uh, we have a special offer from one of our collaborators. I'm going to present you the offer. Um, she is, uh, our collaborator offers 10 vouchers worth 450 lei each for one of the courses she's organizing. EduCoach, represented by its founder, Georgiana Zaharia, who has experience in working with adults and who has got teaching experience as well, hosts one-to-one -one sessions group coaching and also sessions meant to help you discover what your superpower is. Uh, my colleague will put the link to her web page in the chat box in a few seconds. Uh, what you'll have to do in order to get uh, to get one of to to be able to win one of these vouchers is um, we will send out a follow up email and um, we will uh, give you um, a feedback form to fill in based on which you will receive your participation certificate. So what you'll need to do in order to receive your participation certificate is basically to fill in the feedback form. Don't worry if you won't be able to do it during the session because you will receive, as I said, a follow-up email after the, after the conference. So what you'll need to do is to fill in the feedback form uh, until Wednesday, the 10th of January by 12 o'clock. And that's the, that's the somehow, uh, that's the same time by which, by when you should fill in the feedback form in order to get your certificate uh, as well. 
And at 1 p.m., we will broadcast uh, live uh, the draw, which will designate the winners of the 10 vouchers that Georgiana has prepared for you. Now we've got a short coffee break. Don't go far. We'll be back at approximately 30, 33 past 11. Um, go get a coffee, go get a, a sandwich, a refreshment, and we'll be back in a few seconds.
Now, I hope you've had time to grab a snack and maybe some coffee, because the conference continues. And I'm happy to introduce our next speaker. So our next speaker today is my colleague, Cosmin Frunze. Cosmin has been an English teacher at Twinkle Star for more than eight years. He has got a BA in English, and for the past years, he has been a mentor for university students who want to pursue a teaching career via the Train to Teach program implemented by Twinkle Star a few years back. Welcome, Cosmin. Welcome. Can everybody hear me? Yes? Okay, good. So we can start, right? Yes, for sure. All right. Just a second. Can you see it? I think you you can start slideshow. Maybe it yeah. will oh, okay. Is it okay? Yeah, yeah. Wonderful. All right. Good. So hello everybody. And uh, thank you for being here today. It is really nice to see so many eager teachers and educators coming together in order to um, yeah, better themselves and to let others share their knowledge and insights. Um, you know, teaching without learning does not exist. But this is true not only when we prepare to become teachers, right? It is even more important once we are teachers and everybody can um, relate to this, I think, from, you know, out of their own experience. And hopefully we'll all remember this during our time uh, in the classroom. Now, what I want us to do today uh, is embark, even if only for a very short period of time, I know, but to embark on a crucial exploration into the heart of education. A journey that delves into the intricate challenge of student engagement in an era that is obviously saturated with all sorts of distractions, right? And it's important now more than ever, in my opinion, to explore and understand solutions to motivate students in this fast-paced and technology-driven world. Now, First of all, I think we should um, explore the changing landscape of education, right? Um, everybody knows that technology and the digital centric culture have significantly transformed the educational landscape in several ways. Now, these are some of the ways I thought of. Access to information before people used to rely solely on traditional textbooks and limited resources. However, nowadays, the internet, which is a very important factor, right, provides instant access to a vast amount of information, enabling students to explore uh, diverse topics, diverse perspectives, right? So they basically come into contact with all sorts of points of view. Then, there's the issue of interactive learning. Before, right, in the past, students had a more, let's say, passive way of learning. And I think we can all relate to this, right, with few interactive elements. Nowadays, technology enables interactive learning through uh, multimedia, simulations, educational apps, making lessons more engaging, and obviously more dynamic, right? Then there's global connectivity. In the past, students had limited exposure to global perspectives, which is very important to take into consideration. Global perspectives, right? There was this separation between cultures, so to speak. People were more isolated. Nowadays, digital communication tools and online platforms they facilitate global collaboration. They connect students. They connect educators and experts from all around the world, as we can see right now, right, during our meeting. And I think we are very privileged to live in this day and age, right? Then there's the issue of remote learning. What options for distant education did people in the past used to have? It was very difficult to do something like this. Nowadays, technology allows students 
to access education remotely, providing both flexibility and accessibility, especially during, let's say, unforeseen circumstances such as COVID and the like. However, the prevalence of distractions and their impact on student engagement must be highlighted. Now, I want us to define the engagement crisis. Definitions are very important all the time, right? What is student engagement? Student engagement refers to the level of active involvement, interest, and participation demonstrated by a student and their learning experiences. And, you know, it's more complex than it may seem at first because it involves a combination of cognitive, emotional, and behavioral components, indicating a student's investment in and connection to the learning process. Now, let's talk a little bit about uh, the importance of engagement during lessons, engagement in the classroom, at school. Student engagement is crucial for several reasons. First, we can talk about academic success, right? I think that we all agree that engaged students tend to perform better academically as their active participation and interest contributes to a more effective learning experience. Uh, then engaged students create a positive and collaborative classroom atmosphere, fostering a sense of community and shared enthusiasm for learning, meaning they go to school happily, okay? Because that's where they meet kindred spirits. And this is what we should aim for, now, making school a place they enjoy, they want to go there, right? Then engaged students are more likely to be motivated, to show persistence in the face of challenges, and to develop a lifelong love for learning. Our goal as teachers is not to, you know, fully educate people, but to make sure that future adults will view learning as an enjoyable everyday activity for the rest of their lives. Then engagement positively impacts students' social and emotional well-being, right? Leading to increased satisfaction, confidence in everyday life, a sense of accomplishment, and let's face it, children spend most of their time at school. This is where their social life begins. If they are not engaged at school, they will associate this engagement with all sorts of relationships, and we do not want that to happen. And finally, developing strong engagement habits prepares students for success in future educational endeavors and their professional life, right? by cultivating essential skills, proactive attitude toward learning and so on. Now, it's also important when we define the crisis that we are currently going through in this you know, educational ecosystem, it's important to know the signs and the symptoms of the engagement crisis. The problem is that many people ignore the signs of an issue, right? And so they'll have to deal with it later on but it will be significantly more difficult to solve the problem then. So we need to mind these things. Now, some signs that I thought of are these ones. First, lack of participation. Just, you know, take a long look at your group, at your class. Students show minimal involvement in class discussions, activities, or other interactive elements. That's a sign of, you know, um, a crisis start, um, I don't know, um, happening, okay, or at the beginning. Um, then you notice a lack of energy, a lack of enthusiasm or interest among students during lessons. That's when you know that something must change. Then uh, students are easily distracted, exhibiting, a, I don't know, a tendency to lose focus on learning material. They start using their phones during lessons. They look through different books and magazines. They are not on the same page or on the right page and so on, right? Then there's incomplete assignments. 
when you see that there, you know, you have a high rate of incomplete assignments or a decline in the quality of submitted work by the students, uh, this may signal disengagement. OK, and, you know, you have to solve a problem. Then there is the issue of reduced social interaction among students, both inside and outside the classroom, which also may indicate disengagement. Now, there are several factors contributing to this crisis, and these are some of the factors affecting uh, student engagement that I thought of. First, digital distractions, right? Constant access to smartphones, uh, social media, and online content. I think this or these things can divert students' attention, leading to decreased focus on educational tasks and reduce uh, reduced engagement. Right? Then you have the information overload. Yes, this is a thing. When a student gets overwhelmed. Yeah, about, you, you know, uh, because of the amount of information they get, particular, particularly with the Internet's vast resources. This can create cognitive overload for students, making it challenging to process and engage deeply with content. Right. Um, um, it makes it difficult for information to um, stay in their minds. Then we can talk about lack of student voice. This can be a factor, okay? This can contribute significantly to the engagement crisis by creating an environment where students feel, let's say, disempowered and disconnected, okay? A lack of student voice. Um, traditional teaching methods, which are, in my opinion, characterized by a one-size-fits-all approach, right? And a focus on uh, teacher-centered instruction. This can be a problem, especially when we have passive learning where students are expected to just absorb information rather than actively participate in the learning process. Then there's a lack of relevance. I know we heard this many times. It's very important to revisit it. When students perceive the learning material as irrelevant to their lives or to their future goals, motivation and engagement suffer. Connecting lessons to real world application, applications, right, enhances relevance and engagement. Now, um, the Journal of Educational Psychology published a study in 2018 indicating that students are more engaged when they see relevance of what they are learning to their personal lives or future careers. So our students, must realize that, for example, the vocabulary we teach as English teachers, right? The grammatical structures they learn will help them entertain meaningful conversations and create, I don't know, valuable relations, relationships out there in the real world, right? So make sure to always emphasize the meaning of what you teach for the real world. Place them in real life scenarios as much as you can. And you will see the difference. Next, consequences of low engagement. Here are some points that we should take into consideration when it comes to this. Okay. What are some of the very serious consequences? Academic underperformance. Engaged students are more likely to actively participate in class. They are more likely to complete assignments and perform well on assessments. Low engagement correlates with academic under uh, achievement, okay, and lower grades. Now, low engagement also often results in a lack of enthusiasm for learning. Students who are not engaged become, I don't know, apathetic. They become disinterested or disengaged from educational processes, right? How can you ever be a good citizen, a decent human being, without a love for learning? Then we have this long-term effects problem on career and well-being. When you have a pattern of disengagement in school, this can have long-term consequences, affecting your career opportunities and overall well-being. Lack of motivation and interest may hinder the development of crucial skills 
needed in the professional world. Now, this means basically that our students may not be able to get proper jobs in order to just live happy lives. Of course, some might say, you know, it was his or her choice not to be engaged during my lessons. Uh, it was his or her choice to be distracted by the world. It's their fault. Well, I'm here to tell you that we bear part of this fault, right? Many times our hands are stained with blood, so to speak. Yes, they get easily distracted. But what else are they supposed to do? They are children. We, on the other hand, we are adults. And our duty to them is exactly this, to act as adults and protect them from themselves even. The only time we can say, you know, it was their choice, their fault, is when we know we did everything in our power to help. Then <clears throat> low engagement may hinder social emotional growth, as I was saying, you know, affecting interpersonal skills, emotional intelligence, and so on. Here are some of the strategies I thought of for motivating students in our world. First, interactive learning methods. We need to think about them more often. What are some examples uh, from what I use during my lessons, for example, I use group discussions. OK, I know it sounds simple, but it's very important and very effective. OK, group discussions facilitate collaborative discussions where students can share ideas. They can share perspectives and insights on a given topic. OK, and they can relate to their peers in this way. They feel more relaxed. They act as if they were in real life situations. They don't always have to communicate with a power figure, you know, like the teacher in our case. Sometimes we can perform better when we know we are not watched. When we know we don't have to prove something to someone, right? And the same thing applies here. Let them discuss with their peers. Then uh, what other interactive methods can we use? Um, quizzes and polls. OK, you can use technology to create quizzes, polls uh, or surveys during lectures to, let's say, gauge student in, uh, uh, understanding, right, and encourage active participation. It's nice when people ask for our opinions. We feel important, don't we? Well, why not give our students this same opportunity? It is good for us. It is good for them. It's good for the whole um, ex experience, right? Then you can use debates. Why not debate? Organize these debates on relevant topics, encouraging students to uh, research, to articulate arguments, and to engage in critical thinking. Some examples uh, of uh, debate topics, I don't know, should the final exams be abolished, for example, right? Or social media, does it do more harm than good? is taxation theft and so on you know of course some are hot topics so we need to be careful but it should be done then technology as a tool we need to incorporate educational apps and software that enhance lessons providing interactive experiences aligned with learning objectives there is kahoot for example yeah this widely used platform for uh, creating and playing learning games. You can use it to assess your students. You can use it to review information, to relax, and so on. There's this platform, uh, Quizzes, which allows teachers to create quizzes, obviously, that students can play individually at their own pace. Bamboozle, WooClap, and so on. Obviously, everybody can find them online. Um, Digital resources, interactive online resources like ebooks and multimedia content to supplement to supplement traditional materials to enrich the learning environment. Right. Um, then other th uh, another thing that I used to do, which was very effective, was this virtual field trips. Yes, you can explore virtual field trips and simulations to bring real world experiences into your classroom, enhancing students understanding of various subjects, you can go visit museums in the classroom, 
okay you can go visit zoos entire cities and so on you can go you know on sightseeing tours in the classroom using technology then again bring real world examples and why not even guest speakers into the classroom right demonstrating the practical applications of the subject uh of the subject matter this can inspire students and increase motivation believe me okay let's say you talked about jobs why not find a lawyer find a doctor or a police officer who knows english and can share for a few minutes their experience this way students will never forget these moments okay uh then establish a positive and inclusive classroom atmosphere a supportive environment free from judgment uh, encourages students to take risks and participate actively. They need to feel like making mistakes is a good thing in the classroom because we can all learn from them. First of all, we all make mistakes and we can all learn from mistakes, right? Then personalize learning approaches. This can be powerful for students as they cater to their individual needs, interests, learning styles, um some ideas for doing this could be uh choice-based assignments for example when you offer students a menu of assignment options related to the same learning objectives right allowing them to choose assignments that align with their interests can increase motivation then you have interest-based projects when where you integrate projects that allow students to explore topics that they enjoy that are not boring and dull connecting connecting learning to their passions can significantly boost motivation right now these are some measures uh, uh th these are some ideas for measuring and assessing engagement right now before we make we start making the necessary changes in our classrooms because I do believe that everybody can make improvements, right? But before starting, we need to properly measure things. We need to know where the problem lies. We must know how to measure and assess the level of engagement of our students. Some good ways of doing this include surveys and questionnaires, right? Um, use student surveys to gather feedback on their level of interests. Uh, on their involvement, satisfaction with the learning experience, okay? You can do this at the end of the week, you can do this at the end of the semester, etc. cetera. Um, you can do it so that their ans answers are anonymous, so that they feel safe, okay, to uh, give honest responses. Classroom observations. I know this is a very common sense thing to do, but we should conduct regular observations to assess students' participation interaction and overall engagement during our um class activities and be intentional about this then we can incorporate peer and self-assessment mechanisms to involve students in evaluating their own engagement and that of their peers obviously right um i used participation logs where you keep records of individual student participation in class discussions, group activities, and other interactive elements, okay? Uh, use a special notebook for this. It will uh, help you get a sense of what's happening in your classroom, okay? It will keep you in charge in a real way. Then evaluate the quality and creativity of students' assignments projects and presentations okay this can be an indirect measure of engagement if you sense that their efforts were minimal when it comes to a certain project then maybe you need to think of different subjects topics and so on when people like something they make an effort now proactive approaches to overcoming challenges in students engagement involve anticipating potential issues and implementing strategies to create a positive and interactive learning environment here are some uh, proactive measures and i'm uh, you know going to move faster a little bit here first foster a positive teacher student relationship greeting students warmly when they get to school 
um, I don't know, showing genuine interest, interest in their well-being and creating a supportive atmosphere can enhance in engagement. Secondly, clearly communicate expectations for behavior, participation, and academic performance. Then use a variety of teaching methods to accommodate different learning styles. Incorporate interactive activities, as I said, group work, multimedia, and so on. Then, and this is very important, set achievable yet challenging learning goals. Goals that are too easy can lead to boredom, while overly difficult goals may discourage students. So we need to find the right balance here, right? Then offer timely feedback on assignments and assessments. Construct constructive feedback helps students understand their strengths uh, and areas of improvement, so to speak, okay? Giving them a sense of continuous development. Then allow students to have some control over their learning experience, offering choices in projects, topics, assignments. And finally, celebrate achievements. This is crucial. Recognize and celebrate both small and significant achievements. Positive reinforcement motivates students and reinforces a sense of accomplishment. That's why we have ceremonies where our students receive diplomas, certificates, all sorts of prizes, right? We take photos with them, we praise them publicly. All these things do wonders when it comes to their uh, psychological development. And finally, at the end of my presentation, I want to say that the importance of collective efforts in overcoming the engagement crisis in education cannot be overstated. Here are some key reasons why collaboration and collective action are crucial. There is this shared responsibility. We are all responsible. Feeling responsible is the first step toward taking actions. Teachers, administrators, uh, parents, why not? The broader community, they all play a role in creating um, an engaging learning environment. Then different people bring diverse perspectives and insights, and we can all learn from each other. Then there's professional development, uh, resource optimization. Collaborative efforts enable the pooling of resources, both human and material, optimizing the potential for creating impactful interventions and support systems, right? Uh, and finally, you know, there's this modeling um, this example issue, modeling collaboration for students. Demonstrating collaboration among adults sets a positive example for our students. They learn the value of teamwork. They learn the value of you know collective problem solving and community involvement by looking at us. We must never forget that we are examples and we, are, we must act accordingly, right? And in essence, I think mutual efforts acknowledge that overcoming the engagement crisis is a shared goal that requires coordinated actions from all those involved in this educational ecosystem. By working together, we can create a more supportive, engaging, and effective learning environment for our students. Well, I hope uh, it's clear that being a teacher is you know, not an easy job by any stretch of the imagination, but it is a very important one. Society needs us more than ever, and um, hopefully we can have the right motivation to make the proper changes. Thank you for listening and for being here. Thank you very much, Kotmin, for all the wonderful insight that you've shared with us on the topic. Very, very useful. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Now, uh, what I'd like to bring to your attention um a few teaching tools that we believe you'll find very useful the first is a teaching aid called bright ideas teachers kit and um uh, i would like to ask my colleague to put the link to that resource specifically in the chat box for you guys separately um it's a set of 50 online cards providing teachers with all sorts of games and ideas uh, for, of interactive uh, interactive activities ideas uh, the second one is Happy Teachers, Happy Students, which is an online course. It's got five modules. Each module focuses on one aspect of teaching that we at Twinkle Star have seen that 
teachers struggle with. So for example, one focuses on wormers, one focuses on fillers, yeah? Um, and one focuses on games that you can use in the classroom. So, so it's a very useful teaching tool. And um, the third one is a, is a webinar that we have hosted uh, and which again contains lots of lots of uh, important or useful information that you could apply with your students in your classrooms. We have a special offer in place. Uh, my colleague will put the the links to the separate to the separate teaching resources, but also to the to the bundle that uh, that we are uh, offering to you today. Um, you can get the the full package for at a reduced price, as you can see. You just need to use the the code, which is Shine 2024, but if I'm not mistaken, it's with uh, capital letters. So you, you might want to try both of them, yeah, with capital letters or without if you want to purchase it and um, get your uh, get your share of uh, it, useful information from uh, from here. We'll also include information about this in our follow up email. So uh, should you like to uh, consult it afterwards? And um, yes, may it be a useful thing for you. Uh, now, next up, we've got not one, but two professionals who um, are joining us all the way from Japan. They are Matthew Turner and Robert J. Lowe. And I think they are here with us today. Matthew, Robert, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Yeah, okay. hello. Hi there. We've Hi there. Time. Nice to meet you, finally. <laughs> uh, so... We're here. Uh, Hello. About Hi, Matthew. Hi there. Um, so alongside his academic career, Matthew has co-authored Podcasting and Professional Development, a guide for English language teachers, is a co-founder of the Technology Podcast and Clear Voices Podcast. His research interests include language teacher education, uh, continuing professional development, and he's an active member of the Japan Association of Language Teacher. On the other hand, Robert, who is next to him, <laughs> is co-author of Teaching English as Lingua Franca, a co-editor of Duo, I'm, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, so I'm going to skip it, but I'll include it there. And uh, his research uh, focuses on critical sociology of English language teaching. He published papers in numerous journals, including language te uh, teaching, applied linguistics review, and other ELT journals. The floor is yours, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, hello, everyone. Um, good. I believe it's good afternoon with you and it's good evening with us. And um, well, we, we logged in about 10 minutes ago and we're <laughs> we're very surprised at the number of people that are here. We, we usually present to about one percent of the amount of people that are here, usually about three to five people. So so to have 350 people here today is um. Yeah, very nerving for us. And yeah, Let's see how many are still there at the end. <laughs> yeah, but um, yeah, we're very honoured to be, to have been invited to this talk today. Um, and thank you for having us. Um, so as as um as I believe Dana introduced us. Um, my name's Matthew Turner. Uh, my name's Robert Lowe. And yeah, um, we're both currently in Japan. It's just gone seven p.m. here. Um. But it's actually been somewhat of a challenging week in Japan. I'm sure. I'm sure you're aware of the sad news of the earthquake and um, and the plane crash too. So it's been quite a, quite a tough week for for us here in Japan. Um, however, we're going to be we're going to be talking about different kinds of challenges today. Uh, challenges that perhaps we're all more familiar with, um, teaching related challenges, and we're going to be focusing on reflection. Um, purposes, practices, and payoffs. And there is one more P there too, which is about podcasting, um, which we're going to be specifically focusing on today. So um, just to introduce ourselves and our podcast, um, first of all. Yep, as I said, <laughs> again, my name is Matthew Turner. Um, I've been working in Japan since 2009. I'm a lecturer at the Tokyo University of Science. Um, I'm not actually a scientist. Um, my role is working in a liberal arts faculty, uh, teaching engineering students um, academic English skills. And my name is Robert Lowe. I'm an associate professor at Ochanomizu University, which we are sitting in now, this very uh, grand room. Um, and my research, uh, as, as Dana said earlier, focuses on the critical sociology of English language teaching. Um, 
And this is our podcast, the Tefalology podcast. Um, we began this podcast in 2014. Initially, the idea of the podcast was to share information about the history of ELT, about activities, classroom practices, theoretical issues, that kind of thing with our listeners. Um, but as we continued producing the podcast, we started to realize that the discussions we were having on the podcast um, were having as much or more benefit for us as the presenters um, as they were for the audience. Um, and this got us interested in the idea of reflection, <clears throat> sorry, reflection. And that's what we're going to be talking about in this presentation. Um, so uh, in this session, first, we're going to talk about why teachers should utilize reflection. After that, we'll talk about how teachers can engage in reflection dialogically. Uh, we'll talk about podcasting as a form of reflective practice. So we'll look at some of uh, our own podcasting and, and play you uh, some sections from the podcast showing how we use podcasting to reflect. Um, and then finally, we'll talk about some benefits of reflection. And depending on how much time we have, we'll uh, we'll leave some space for questions and comments from the audience. Yeah, hopefully there'll be about 10 minutes at the end for questions and comments. And if you'd like to know more information about the, the podcast itself, uh, we can we can talk more in detail about that then. So reflection and reflective practice. Um, first of all, what is reflection? Um, we're going to just use a, a definition from Dewey, who is very closely connected to the idea of reflection, particularly in education. Um, Dewey defines reflection as an active, persistent, and careful consideration of a belief or supposed form of knowledge in light of the grounds that support it and the further consequences to which it leads. Basically, this means not taking something that you believe or something you think you know for granted, not being stuck with that idea, um, but trying to constantly consider and reconsider the things that you know and the things you, that you believe uh, based on new evidence and also based on looking at uh, what happens when you follow that belief to its logical conclusions. Um, so it's, a, it's an active and uh, considerative uh, or deliberative uh, approach to knowledge. Um, and reflective practice. So this is when you apply reflection to education. Thomas Farrell is perhaps one of the uh, most prominent uh, proponents of reflective practice in language education. And he suggests that reflective practice occurs when teachers consciously take on the role of reflective practitioner and subject their own beliefs about teaching and learning to critical analysis, take full responsibility of their actions in the classroom and continue to improve their teaching practice. So rather than just taking whatever uh, a teacher learned in their initial teacher training, um, they are constantly reevaluating their beliefs and their practices in light of what happens in the classroom um, and their continuing professional experiences. Um, so this is a very basic definition of reflective practice. We'll look at some more details about reflective practice in a moment. And yeah, and Thomas Farrell himself, he's been on our podcast twice, I believe. Mm. So there's a couple of episodes actually with us speaking to him. Yeah, and he wrote the foreword to our book. He did as well, yeah. Available <laughs> at a reasonable price. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, why should teachers utilize reflection? Um, well, firstly, uh, reflective practice is geared towards teachers navigating moral, critical, cognitive, metacognitive, and practical questions. Again, this is from Farrell. Um, what does that look like in detail? Well, we're going to look at three different uh, issues or three different reasons that teachers should engage in reflective practice. Um, the first of these is to adjust their practices in response to new challenges. Um, so here are just some examples of the kinds of challenges which might prompt reflection on the part of a teacher. Uh, firstly, teaching a new student level um, or a mixed level class. I'm sure many of the people in the audience have had the experience of going from teaching one level of uh, proficiency um, to a class which is a very different level of proficiency or a class where the proficiency levels are completely mixed. Um, and a lot of your teaching strategies, um, the ways that you give instructions, all that kind of thing, no longer work quite as well as they did before. Um, that's a challenge which you have to reflect on and respond to. Um, another example, something that we've both uh, experienced and written about in the past, is teaching students with special educational needs. Um, so we've both had experiences of, of um, having students with particular needs joining the classroom um, and, you know, not having any real education or training 
in how to create a diverse and welcoming environment for those students. Um, and so the way that we both approached this was to engage in a reflective practice, uh, a, a form of reflective practice where we, we tried things out, we reflected on them, we tried changing things again until we could create a classroom environment which was welcoming to everybody. Um, another example is teaching different age levels. Uh, I teach mainly university students, but occasionally recently I've had to go back to teaching uh, high school students. So I've had to give special lectures at the high school here. Um, and uh, I found that, you know, high school students do not necessarily have the same levels of, uh, of English or of maturity um, that university students do. Um, and so I had to adjust some of my, my speaking and some of the activities that I did, uh, you know, on that, on that basis. Um, and perhaps the most obvious uh, kind of challenge that teachers face is students being uninterested in class or, or not finding the materials engaging. Uh, something that happens very often in Japan is students uh, falling asleep in the middle of classes. <laughs> um, and again, this is something that as a teacher, you know, you want your students to be engaged, you want them to be interested. Uh, and so you may be prompted to reflect on what caused or led to that situation and what you could do to avoid it or ameliorate it in the future. So these are some of the challenges that uh, teachers may want to respond to reflectively. Yeah, and we we just we just caught the end of the the presentation before us by Cosmin, and and it was about engagement. And I think this um this connects quite well to his talk um about how to encourage or how to promote uh, better engagement, perhaps predominantly with students, but also teachers too. Of course, teachers need to feel engaged as well. Um. One way that teachers can feel engaged and, one, and another way that um, often brings about opportunities for reflection is when, well, when either when we have to be observed by other teachers or when we see the opportunity to, to watch our peers teaching, uh, we can learn a lot and it can generate opportunities for reflection. So as I said, perhaps reflection comes about I guess um, this is mo most common form of reflection is when we're kind of kind of told we need to reflect. Um, is that a valid form of reflection? Um, that's perhaps one question we can ask, but it's perhaps the most kind of common form of reflection we're all used to when we we have to reflect um, for kind of a intrinsic purpose, such as um, an in-service requirement, a teach a teaching educational program requirement, uh, where we're asked to uh, reflect by a supervisor or manager. Um, we may wish to observe other people's teaching to learn from their practices, um, and we may want people to to watch our own teaching as well um, in response to particular crises uh, that we may be experiencing as well. So all of these can generate re opportunities for reflection. Um. A third reason that teachers might utilize reflection is in order to consider and react to critical issues. Um, we've got here an image from one of our podcasts where we spoke to uh, Suleiman Jenkins. Um, and this was, uh, as you can see from the date, this was uh, happening during the Black Lives Matter protests in America um, and, and around the world. Um, and, you know, we had not really considered uh, how some of the issues that were being raised in those protests might have some uh, connections to language teaching and to the things that we do in the classroom. Uh, and so we, we decided to speak to Solomon about that. Um, it was a very interesting episode. Uh, and this was, you know, a, a critical issue that we wanted to respond to. So critical issues broadly relate to the politics of the classroom. Um, and here are just some examples of the kinds of critical issues that teachers might want to reflect on. Um, so firstly, what models of English do we present in our classes? Um, are we just presenting American and British English? Um, or are we thinking uh, about you know, other types of English that the students may uh, encounter uh, in their lives as, as language users? What cultural norms do we assume? Uh, are we using textbooks which show kind of middle-class Western lifestyles? Um, and are those lifestyles the kinds of things which are relevant to the lives of our students? Um, what assumptions do we make about students' identities, backgrounds, sexualities, and things like that? Um, for example, I, I've, I, I've had colleagues in the past who have uh, given activities to students which say things like, please discuss your ideal boyfriend, this in a, uh, a, a women's university. 
Um, and, you know, I suggested, well, why don't you change the word boyfriend to partner? Because, you know, you, you don't want to necessarily make assumptions about uh, the students' identities. Um, and in general, I think it's important for teachers to think about the assumptions and the taken for granted uh, ideas that they, you know, rely on when they're planning lessons and designing activities um, and, to, and to challenge those assumptions in order to make sure that the classroom is a place which is welcoming for as many different people uh, from as many different backgrounds as possible. Um, so this is another reason for reflection, uh, to think about these critical issues to make sure that our classrooms are an, an open and welcoming space for all. Okay, so today we want to specifically focus on forms of dialogic reflection. Um, of course, teachers have the option to reflect individually uh, through keeping a journal, for example. It's very common to keep a journal or a reflective journal of your own teaching. However, today we want to kind of focus on dialogic forms of interaction, as we see that as being more kind of more related to our podcast. So what is dialogic reflection and how, how can teachers go about it? Um, so put very simply, Rashid 2018 um, says that reflection occurs through conversation. This is dialogic reflection. And conversation refers to many different uh, models. It can be spoken or it can be written as well. Um, but essentially, with dialogic reflection, you are creating a new space to unlock potential learning that perhaps wouldn't be achievable if you were reflecting individually. Through dialogic reflection and creating dialogic spaces to work on learning with a peer, for example, um, you are using kind of the powers of mediation and you are using other people's knowledge resources to create new and enhanced knowledge. Um, this speaks to the work of uh, Vygotsky and the zone of proximal development, uh, which, you, which you're probably aware of, um, where you're kind of creating this, this enhanced space of potential learning. Um, there are many ways, like I said, for teachers to reflect dialogically in conversation with others. However, we, we believe that dialogic reflection is best done through structured protocols. And this kind of sounds quite strict and kind of um, scary, I guess. But what it means is kind of specialized forms of speaking um, that promote um, cooperation, that are collegial, I always struggle with saying this word, collegial, and are non-judgmental. Um, in these kind of types of interaction, speakers have different roles, and it's all tailored towards um, self-development. Um, a few examples include critical friendships, which we'll talk about, uh, cooperative development interactions, and we'll also talk about later in more detail um, how our podcast is a form of um, structured dialogic reflection. So critical friendships, I'm sure some people in the audience have, uh, have heard about these before. Um, in a critical friendship, you work with a critical friend that is um, a peer, uh, a colleague who you trust, you have a very trusting relationship with. Um, and who is willing to give you honest uh, and critical feedback. Um, so generally in a critical friendship, you follow this uh, three-step process. You identify an issue to be addressed. This could be an issue in your classroom. Um, in fact, in, in education, it most usually is. Um, you discuss the issue with the critical friend and the critical friend can provide feedback by uh, firstly asking questions to clarify the issue so they can try to you know, make sure uh, that the issue is what you think the issue is. Um, often the issue may reside somewhere that you were not aware of, um, but they can ask questions to kind of clarify that. Um, secondly, they can critique the friend's work. And finally, they can provide data to help address the issue. Um, as you can see, this could be quite face threatening. Um, critiquing a friend's work uh, sounds like you know, something that you, you wouldn't want to do. Um, and that highlights, I think, why it's so important that a critical friend has to be someone who is um, 
who you have a very trusting and close relationship with um, so that they can be critical while at the same time being constructive and so that you can accept the criticisms and answer the questions without getting defensive. Um, so a critical friendship is a very uh, prominent form of dialogic reflection. Another form that's very similar and may include critical friends is a cooperative development, often abbreviated as a CD, not, not compact disc, but a cooperative development. Um, this isn't particularly well known in the field of ELT. It's kind of fallen out of favor somewhat or hasn't, hasn't been given the exposure that I think it deserves. Um, but it was originally coined by Julian Edge um, in the early 2000s. And it's, it's a deliberate approach of communicating with others to work on individual self-development. Um, there are very clear conventions to this way of talking. Um, there, is no, there is a set amount of time. There are speakers and understanders. And these roles are very strictly observed. Um, cooperative development is a discourse framework um, where different skills are used to help the speaker, help the speaker. And these include challenging, focusing, reflecting, and there are many others as well. We'll show you an example of what that looks like now. Okay, so here, here is a piece of dialogue taken from some work by Steve Mann from 2008. Um, as you can see, we have Harry, who is the understander, and Ella, who is the speaker. So as you can see, Harry is trying to clarify uh, what Ella wants to articulate. So what you're saying is, if I've understood you correctly, if you watch, if we can carry on with this metaphor. Okay, so prior to this, um, Ella was describing a metaphor related to her teaching experiences. And Harry's role here is to clarify and kind of take out all the, not, not take out, but <laughs> extract all of the important and essential information about what Ella wants to say. So Harry repeats the words, driving it, driving it. And so he really focuses in on these, these words within this, this uh, larger metaphor. Um, so this is a form of dialogic reflection using metaphor in this particular example. Um, but as you can see, there are very clear roles. Um, Harry is not giving his opinion, his perspective. He's not giving unwanted advice. He is simply letting Ella uh, try to articulate what she wants to say. So our podcast, um, we situate this as an in the wild activity. Um, what does this mean, in the wild reflection? Well, this is reflective practice or practices um, that are integrated into daily professional lives beyond teacher education programs. And this is a key point. Um, this isn't reflection that takes place within a teacher program, as I said before, um, through a supervisor requiring it. Um, this is reflection that takes place. So I've got a hand up there, but I'll continue for the time being. Um, this is reflection that takes place um, independently of an institution. Um, it's bottom up and it's usually done for intrinsic or extrinsic purposes. Uh, it can be evidence led, protocol based. You can follow a strict protocol uh, like we just introduced, or it can be ad hoc it can be very informal taking place in a staff room or taking place on the train or, or taking place in a pub. Um, reflection happens everywhere in the wild and it's independent and bottom up and it's self-sustaining uh, from the practitioners themselves. So we situate our podcast as being an in the wild activity. So podcasting, uh, as we've said, is, is a form of reflective practice for us. And we'd like to talk about this and give some examples um, and give a particular example 
from the podcast. Um, so is this me? Okay, yeah. <laughs> this is me again. Um, yeah. So over the years, we've um, so the podcast started out as something we made as a hobby. However, in over the past five years or so, we've started kind of trying to conceptualize it a lot more formally, and kind of view it as a as a as a research endeavor as well as well as a, a reflective endeavor. So we've come to view podcasting as a reflective medium. Um, we're not particularly interested in the technological side of podcasting, um, such as where where to share podcasts um, and, and that kind of side of things. We're more interested in podcasting as an affordance mechanism. It's something that we use to reflect dialogically and sustain our reflective dialogue uh, amongst peers. Podcasting is also very intimate too. Um, I'm sure many of you listen to podcasts. I don't want to embarrass ourselves by asking if you've listened to our podcast. Um, however, that said, uh, podcasting is an intimate activity. It's something you do maybe before you sleep. It's something you do whilst you're doing the washing up. It's something you may listen to um, in the car or on the train. It's very intimate and you build up a parasocial relationship with the speakers of podcasts. And podcasting, the, the field of podcasting, um, covers a range of topics. If you can think of it, there's a podcast about it. Um, and podcasts kind of bridge, they, they, they act as a bridging medium um, so if you take a topic about engineering or science, usually the podcast is conversational and digestible. So when we say intimate bridging medium, this is what this refers to. It's also an idiosyncratic form of speaking. Um, arguably, the way that people speak on podcasts are different to how you perhaps reflect um, in a school with a supervisor or a manager. Um, it blends the performativity, speaking for an audience, and it's also private as well. You're, you're making conversations with your colleagues, with your peers in a room together. So it kind of blends these elements together, which we'll talk about uh, next. Uh, finally, it's also multimodal. Um, from podcasts, you can produce scripts, you can produce textual kind of aids and materials. Um, Podcasts are, are predominantly aural. You listen to podcasts and they are temporal as well. You can pause, you can go back, you can listen two years later. They always kind of exist. And they also help you to reflect even after the event as well. So we've come, like I said, over the years, we started out very informally with podcasting. However, these days we kind of realize that our podcast is not just a recording we make and we put out on the internet. Um, it's part of a larger reflective ecosystem. Um, so what happens first is when, we, when we're going to produce an episode, we bring in our identities as hosts, our experiences, our beliefs, our existing knowledge. We bring all of that to the table. We then prepare for episodes. We do this together dialogically. There's there's one more of us as well, by the way, who's not here today. Um, all of this goes into the production of a of a podcast, of of a of a piece of audio that we sit down and produce together. Upon completing an episode, um, there is an effect on the participants, on ourselves. Uh, we go away. We think about what we said or what we didn't say, or what others said, or how we'd say things differently. We think about our practice. Um, we also, the guests that we invite on as well, they also think too and reflect on, on taking part in our podcast. There's also an effect on the audience as well, and it becomes a, a resource in the field. Um, this sometimes generates feedback. We get we get comments um, on social media, for example, or we get emails, and this feeds back into our preparation. Um, so you can kind of see how everything is kind of interconnected into this uh, larger reflective ecosystem. Um, 
and again this doesn't just have to be about a podcast you can use this kind of ecosystem for your own reflective activities so one uh, main thing which has emerged from our kind of study of the reflective uh, and dialogic elements of podcasting is the idea of the critical co-presentership. Um, earlier, we mentioned the critical friendship um, and critical co-presentership is a, a concept which we've developed um, kind of based on that, but also taking into account some of the unique characteristics of podcasting. Um, basically, through engaging with our co-presenters, um, on you know ELT theory and practice topics related to that kind of thing, um, we are able to develop our ideas and beliefs. Um, so it's, it's kind of similar to a critical uh, friendship, but there are some unique characteristics, as I said. The main uh, characteristic, I guess, is that critical co-presentorships are public facing and performative. Um, when you're on a podcast, you are performing for an audience and you're aware that people are going to be listening to what you're saying. So there's an element in which perhaps you're not quite as open and quite as honest as you might be when you're speaking to only one person. Um, so that's that's maybe one kind of disadvantage of a critical co-presentorship as compared to a critical friendship. But there are also some advantages. Firstly, in a critical co-presentorship, when you are listening to your co-presenter, you're playing the role of the audience. Um, so you're not just listening and asking questions um, for your own sake or for the sake of your partner, you're also trying to anticipate what the audience would want to know and what the audience might not understand or what they would want clarifications about. Um, and so playing the role of the audience prompts critical questioning that you perhaps wouldn't get in other types of dialogic reflection. Secondly, podcasts are kind of limited in time. I mean, I guess, you know, technically you can have a 10 hour long podcast, but Who's going to listen to that? Probably these days, a lot of people would. But um, when when most people make podcasts, they try to limit them to you know 30, 40 minutes, an hour maybe. Um, and this means there is uh, there there has to be an end point to each discussion in the podcast. Um, and so when you're having these discussions with your critical co-presenters, you are trying to find a resolution um, to the discussion. You're trying to find a natural end point. So. You are, um, you're maybe disagreeing about something or discussing the nuance of a particular issue, but you are aware that the time is coming where you're gonna have to end the discussion and you want to end it on some kind of resolution. So there's a push to try and find a compromise, to try and find a resolution, to try and come to some kind of natural end point. Um, and this is another strength, I think, of critical co-presentorships. Finally, in a critical friendship, you're talking about an issue purely from a personal perspective. Um, however, with a critical co-presentorship, you're moving between the personal, your personal experiences, the examples that you bring to the discussion, and the universal. Um, how does this apply to the listeners? How does this apply to other teachers? How does this apply to the field as a whole? Um, so because you're moving between universalization and personalization, there is a possibility of getting some critical distance. Um, if you're just talking about your own personal experiences, things that you did in the classroom, and then there's some criticism, there is a tendency to become defensive, perhaps, right? In a critical friendship, as I said, you want someone who uh, you trust so that you can avoid that. But I think there's always a human tendency to be a bit defensive when you're facing criticism. Um, however, if you are talking about a universal phenomenon and you're using your experience just as an example of the universal phenomenon, then that allows some critical distance. You put on the podcaster mask um, and it doesn't affect you as much. It gives you more of an opportunity to discuss the issues in a, in a, in a, in a cool, um, in a, uh, an unaffected way. Um, so I think that's another main benefit of critical co-presenterships. And we're going to look at one example of uh, dialogic reflection in the podcast. Um, so this comes from some research we did uh, where we looked back through episodes of the podcast. Um, and this was published in the uh, the JALT, J Japan Association of Language Teaching Conference Proceedings. Um, in this particular example, I was examining um, one of the episodes where we talked about testing and assessment and um, and I analyzed some data from Matt, so yeah. forgive me, Matt, it's nothing personal. <laughs> um, and 
we we followed the uh, the uh, format that you can see on the screen. So um, about a year or two ago, we changed the format of the podcast uh, to focus on this three part structure. In the first part of the podcast, um, the three presenters have a discussion on an ELT related topic. In this case, it was assessment. In the second part, we invite an expert, usually an academic or someone very well known in the field, um, to come in and address some of the points that we raised in part one. And I should say, usually in these discussions, we are not experts. We do have areas that we are experts on, but you know, for the for the purpose of reflective practice, we try to choose topics that we are not experts on. Um, so we discuss the topic in part one and we share our current understanding. We invite an expert on in part two to listen to what we just said and then address some points that they thought were necessary to address. And then finally, the three of us return and discuss what we learned and how our understandings changed as a result of that. Now yep. we're gonna we're gonna play some audio. However, we need to we need to just change a setting that I don't think we turned on. So allow me to do this very quickly. Here we go. And we're back. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you. Um so we're going to uh, listen to a, a clip from part one of the podcast, then part two, then part three. Uh, in part one, we were discussing the topic of testing and assessment and the relationship between the two. Let's have a listen. Yeah, but what, what do you think? Like? Just as you were speaking, I was thinking I, I use tests to assess. Mm -hmm. But there are, like you were saying, there are other ways to assess my students. But I use, so the way that tests function for me are as a form of assessment. Mm -hmm. But there could be other forms of assessment, but mm -hmm. like evaluation. Hmm. But yeah. I, I use a, a, a thing that looks like a test that has kind of the trapping that said. So it's a, the, the, the term test is much narrower in scope and it denotes a particular kind of assessment. Um, so um, basically you elicit some kind of performance, for example, uh, a snapshot of somebody's language ability. So you can then make some kind of inference uh, about their ability based on that performance or a decision. And that is um, usually on the basis of a test score. So you basically quantify um, the performance, right? You might have some kind of, um, you know, I mean, you were talking about multiple choice, or it might be some kind of um, discourse level written performance, and then you assign a test score to that. And then that test score is used um, as a basis for some kind of decision making. Um, so the key thing here is that um, if you were thinking of concentric circles, which is how I often show this visually, assessment would be the big circle. It would um, include, uh, so it would be a very large circle and it would include various kinds of assessments. Um, so you'd have the smaller circles, portfolios, observations, um, you know, interviews or whatever um, kind of assessment you, you'd have. And then um, a test would be one kind of assessment where a score is assigned and then usually some kind of decision is made on the basis of that score. Does that make sense? So here our expert came in and explained that testing is a form or a part of assessment, but if you think of a Venn diagram, you have assessment as the, the large circle and testing is just one specific element of assessment. Um, so unlike, as Matt said earlier, these two being the same thing, they're actually distinct but related concepts. Um, so in the third part, we hear Matt's uh, developed understanding in response to that. Yeah, I think mm. she mentioned like that, it, like a performance, like a quantifiable performance, it, it elicits a score, which goes on to, which leads to a decision of some sort. I think mm. that was something that she said. So yeah, I wonder, I wonder if that decision is a, a decision on a grade or a decision on like a feedback point. Like, I, I think it can be both maybe. Yeah. I mean, I guess the idea of, of a very base definition means that assessment, it's sort of a wild enough, wide enough field that obviously there is different, a lot of different things you can do with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that, and for me still, I'm still kind of torn between that. Am I, am I testing just for a grade or am I, 
am I trying to um, produce some sort of portfolio um, of of what they can achieve, what 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 my students can do? Um, and I think I'm still using tests as a way to decide a grade still, mm. um, which mm. I, I don't know if that's necessarily the wrong wrong thing to do, but I don't think I'm fully utilizing them perhaps. Okay, so in that clip, you can see um, that Matt's understanding of the relation between testing and assessment had developed, it had changed, and he'd perhaps come to an understanding that he was overusing tests in decision making, and he could be using other elements of assessment. So here in this three-part structure, you see how dialogue with, uh, with us and with the expert uh, led to a change in Matt's understanding. Yeah, and I'm still very confused about testing and assessment. Um, <laughs> But I have I have a refined understanding now, so a, a little more understanding of what what this is. Um, so finally, we want to kind of come on with some practical suggestions for you um, about the benefits of dialogic reflection. Um, so for us, firstly, for us, um, uh, reflection has brought refreshed understanding of practice, whether that be about assessment. Uh, or testing, or any other topics um, that, that relate to our profession. Um, we appreciate and, and understand the context that we work in a lot more, the, the colleagues we work with, the, the students we teach. And that's all come about through um, the podcast has given us that opportunity to reflect critically. And we've learned from others. I've learned from Rob. I've learned from my other colleagues. I've learned from our guests. Um, through through the process of making podcasts i've i've taken on their knowledge and we've created new knowledge together of course you don't need a podcast to to implement any of these these ways of talking you could simply form a peer support group if you're not doing so already um, or you could find a critical friend or identify somebody who could be uh, a critical friend uh, from your existing peers um, what we would encourage is a form, it should be evidence-based and any kind of reflection should have some kind of data or evidence that you talk about, um, whether that be a, a piece of audio recording from your class, maybe some notes that you took, or it could just be a question that you have that you want to address. Um, reflection is perhaps best done if it's evidence-led. And we'd also like you to consider the role that an audience plays. Um, record your reflections, play them to others, listen back yourself. Um, the inclusion of an audience is very powerful. Um, and if you can build this into your reflection, this might help to kind of harness um, what you get out of your reflection. Um, we're gonna we're gonna have time for some questions, but I just want to end with a couple of pictures that ties in with this idea of challenging. Um, I think as teachers, we should never be too comfortable. Um, we should always be kind of seeing our profession as a tightrope, as something that's precarious. Um, but I think this can bring about reward. You know, if we take that that step off the cliff, um, if we take that challenge it can bring about new insights into our teaching. And if we go through a process of feedback, of dialogue with others, whether that be listeners or peers, we can enhance our, our reflections even further. And finally, when we get to the other end, not if, when we get to the other end, we can look back on the process and we can reflect on the challenges we took so Bell, Bell calls this the prizes of vulnerability. Um, yeah, it's okay to sit with your vulnerabilities and difficulties, and you should really be using them as a, a, to harness your reflections. Okay, so thank you for your time. We Hopefully we have about five minutes for questions, um, comments or questions. Um, but yeah, thank you very much for listening. We can stop sharing our screen maybe and then we can see the, the mm -hmm. whole okay i think that what you can see is a lot of thank yous oh yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs>
because what I think I am talking about myself and I'm sure I'm not the only one that's been mesmerized by your presentation. It got me reflecting on my reflection techniques and, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and on my teaching overall, of course. So thank you. Thank you very much for this very, very useful presentation, very useful input that you've shared with us today. Thank you. Well, that's something we didn't say as well, is that as well as being reflective, it's also reflexive as well. So like you said, you're thinking about your own reflection as well. So that's a, mm -hmm. that's reflexivity as well, which is a whole other area that um, is, 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 is worthy of another presentation, perhaps. But uh, you got uh, we've got two thinking. people with... <laughs> We've got two people with hands up. Um, would 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 someone like to to ask a question? You know, directly. Yeah, please ask questions in the chat box if you have them. Ah, in the chat There's box. One. Okay. There is uh, one. Well, one question is: uh, How do you deal with colleagues that do not want to accept that somebody knows more than them and work towards change? Well, as somebody who doesn't like to accept that somebody knows more than them, um, I uh, I think it's it's just really important to approach reflection with the right mindset. And um, if, if somebody uh, is not willing to, you know, accept that somebody could know more than them or that they could, um, you know, benefit from discussing ideas with someone else, then there's there's not really a lot that you can do. But I think maybe through modeling um, a, a successful reflective relationship um, and, and showing people how it's done and what kind of attitude to adopt, then that's perhaps one way that uh, you can, you can, you know, uh, encourage people to be a bit more open to this kind of thing. Yeah, and I'd answer that by saying, try to question just as, as much as possible. Try not to um, pass judgment on them. Um, try to question their their perspective, their position. They may not want to change, and that's completely fine. It's fine not not to want to change, um, but that should be kind of validated and and questioned and challenged. Um, yeah. Mm. Um, do we have any any questions or comments or see some hands raised yeah. or lots of thank yeah. yous? <laughs> you got the so <laughs> mesmerized during the presentation, and now it's time for us to react to it. Uh, yeah, yeah, thank improvement you. rather than change. Yeah, so I guess semantically they're very they're very different things. Um, what I'm what I'm very careful on when I talk about reflection is reflection doesn't always lead to better like that idea of better teaching. I'm I'm really careful of not using that word in my writing because yeah, it's not it's not a case of going from point one to point ten and that kind of linear upwards direction. It's more kind of you're expanding your knowledge, being being expansive. So. Um, yeah, that's interesting. Change and improvement, and yeah, that's an interesting distinction. Yeah, you, you went through the slides that I made earlier and, and changed the word improvement to change. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Or even we disagree ourselves. Yeah, yeah. Um, as Robert said, we we haven't made a podcast for about a year now due to various reasons. However, um, we will return. Um, but we have about ten years worth of episodes there if you do want to take a listen. But we're not advertising. And this is an academic pursuit for us, so uh, and it's all free, of course. And yeah, we'd love to hear from you if you're interested in podcasting. Um, if if podcasting is already a part of your institution, um, yeah, we'd be interested to hear about that. Thank you very much once again, Robert and Matthew. It was an honor to have you here alongside us. Thank you for inviting very, us, very and thank you everyone for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Let's move on. Uh, one second. Uh, I'd like to bring something to your attention very quickly. It's a contest uh, for students that is very dear to us and which Twinkle Star organizes every year, namely English Way and German Way. Um, it's designed for multiple levels in keeping with the principle of integration of skills. So we try to cover as much as possible within the subjects that we put forward. And uh, we try to make them resemble um, Cambridge exams papers and, uh, and to make them as uh, integrating as possible so that students get a clear idea of what their level is after uh, taking the, the tests or after doing the exercises that we put forward. 
By participating through participation, uh, students receive diplomas, surprise prizes, and the teachers we collaborate with also get a bonus for enrolling students in the contest. Um, my colleague will put the, the link to the contest in the chat box. You can also scan the QR code on your screen to find out more. And should you wish to enroll your students in this contest, we look forward to discussing about it. Uh, now that we've uh, covered that, we have yet another speaker prepared to share some information, some insights uh, with us today, namely uh, Mirela Ursu. She's an English teacher uh, at Stefan Bursanescu School in Yash. She And since graduating, she has been all about teaching English in fun and innovative ways. Those who know her, the people who know her, know that it's a, it's a thing for her to do things this way. She has successfully mixed the rigors of preparing students for Cambridge exams with the use of digital resources and engaging activities throughout her career. She's a firm believer that the magic of learning really happens when teachers and students click. Passionate about making every student feel like they can conquer and challenge uh, any obstacle uh, in their learning journey. Mirela? Thank you very much, Tom. Um, I'm very excited to be here and thank you, Twinklestar, for you know, giving me this opportunity. And I'm very happy to, to have attended the, the, the presentations of, of my co-presenters because uh, it, it makes me very optimistic to see that people who know much more than me in teaching English and a lot of other things are preoccupied by similar matters. And uh, it makes me very uh, optimistic that I'm uh, on the right track as yes, seeing others um, asking the same questions or similar questions as uh, as I keep asking myself about teaching and learning in general. That makes me very happy. Okay. Um, the topic of, of this executive, uh, can you, is it clear my presentation? Is it on? Now it is. Anna? Okay, thank you. Um, I have always been preoccupied by uh, the gap between what I uh, what I believed my students would cap were capable of and could achieve, and their actual achievements, because not all of uh, of the students I work with um, managed to achieve what I believed was their potential, not necessarily in English. And I, it, it was something that was always on my mind. Why? Why do some some kids do so well in school, even if they're not particularly talented for a subject or particularly creative? And others who I believed were more, um, more talented, more creative, um, even brighter in general, um, didn't manage to to succeed. And I'd like you, if you want, to write in chat. What do you think it is besides intellectual abilities that makes some students achieve very good results and others not so much? If you like to share your thoughts. Okay, yeah, motivation, thank you. Emotional intelligence, mm -hmm. creativity, interest, yeah. Engagement, yeah, active involvement, like, like Cosmin said. Mm -hmm. Emotional and social intelligence. That's right. Yeah, perseverance, vision, or lack of, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, the, the, those are elements I, I thought of, plus uh, their family background, their fam the, the support they got, uh, their in social environment, and so on. But though, um, some of those are factors that I couldn't have any control of as a teacher. And I kept wondering, what are the variables, the, the specific elements that I could act on? What is within my, uh, my reach and my control besides methods and games and uh, engaging activities? Because um, um, I, I've always been preoccupied with 
those. And uh, during the pandemic, for example, I uh, educated myself um, in uh, online uh, tools and games and interactive activities and everything related to, to teaching online. And I had the feeling I had, uh, I was already doing pretty much everything by the book. And for some of my students, it wasn't enough. And I kept wondering why, why? Um, I'm not referring only why do they fail in English? Because usually they don't have uh, so many troubles with English. Um, in other subjects, in school in general. And that brought me to executive functions. <clears throat> Which research shows are better predictors of success than IQ and creativity and talent. It, I was surprised to find that out. There are some definitions here. Executive function represents the ability to consciously control our thoughts, emotions, and actions in order to achieve goals. And another definition that I think is more, um, easy to understand for, for kids is like the conductor of the orchestra, a single person who controls everything happening in that orchestra. So basically, executive function means our ability to direct all our internal resources toward a certain goal, toward some, some activity. And they, uh, strong executive functions are predictors not only of school success, but of success in general, better health, better uh, relationship, um, finances, a better life in general. And that is why I consider they deserve some attention from us as teachers. There are quite a few of them. Some of them I was aware of. Um, that they are important or they, they had uh, this name, like time management, for example. Some of them, not so much. And they are response inhibition, the ability to think before acting, not acting on impulse. Working memory, holding information in memory while performing complex tasks. Emotional control, which some of you mentioned, yeah, emotional control, emotional intelligence, um, being able to, to manage our emotion and use them, not let them derail us in certain situations. Flexibility, the ability to change and adapt, to see some things from many, more than one perspective. Sustained attention, paying attention even if you're tired, bored, or not interested. And as Cosmin said, this is quite difficult in this age. Now, there are many factors that impact our attention, task initiation, beginning projects and tasks in a timely fashion. I was surprised to, to find out that this is an issue. I, I wasn't aware that some people might have trouble um, actually starting to do what they need to do. Planning and prioritizing, creating a roadmap to reach a goal, seeing what's relevant, what's not, what the steps are towards a certain goal. Organization, creating and maintaining systems to keep track of information or materials. Time management, having a sense that time is important and using time in our favor. Yeah? Being able to be on time, to follow deadlines, to, to, to have a, a precise sense of how time passes. And goal-directed persistence, particularly important in long-term endeavors, like preparing for exams or long projects and so on. And metacognition, noticing how you're doing and thinking about how you're thinking. Uh, I have to admit this is my favorite and I particularly um, uh, like the presentation about uh, reflection because I think it is very, very important. I'm not not sure if it's the most important um, executive function, but without decent metacognition skills, it's very difficult for us to uh, to see how we're doing, where the issues are, how to improve the way we do things or we think. I think it is a very important skill to, to develop uh, for ourselves and for our students. And some key facts you know, to highlight um, this um, 
about these executive skills. Uh, they are skills, so they can be developed at any age. They are not innate traits. Um, they are learned over time by watching them modeled by others and through practice. So the more practice, the better. They start developing at different ages and continue developing. This also makes me very optimistic about, uh, about uh, them because we can improve them at any age. They develop at different paces. Each person has different strengths and weaknesses. So it's normal for a person to, to have strong organizational skills and I don't know, maybe a weaker work memory, for example. And the actual capacity to use them in specific context varies. Um, familiarity, experience, how interested we are in a certain context of our topic. Um, that's why many times some uh, a maths a teacher might have a very different opinion on uh, on a student's performance or than the English teacher, for example. Yeah, they might behave like different people in various uh, contexts or subjects. There are some factors that can impact negatively this executive function development, like genetic predispositions, such as temperament. Somebody who's more impatient by nature will find it more difficult to sustain attention, for example, or to in inhibit the their impulses the stage in development they do not fully mature until our mid-20s modern life with all the attractions and instant gratification and in media it's not very helpful for for the development of, of these functions of course learning disabilities students with learning disabilities have extra challenges in some of, of these functions and they might need more intervention, more professional interventions to, to support them. And adverse childhood experiences, high levels of stress occurring for a long period of time during childhood. That could be anything uh, ranging from loss of a parent or um, social um, background that's not very supportive, or household dysfunction. It doesn't necessarily have to be something very dramatic over long periods of time, instability and um, troubles at home can impact very much the development of, of these uh, functions and of, of cognitive skills in general, which of course makes these students more vulnerable when it comes to learning and not only in school related contexts. The positive side, of course, is that there are enough factors that can uh, contribute positively to, to uh, for the development of these skills. First and foremost, safe home and school environment and supportive relationships, significant adults with strong executive skills. Teachers can be significant adults in some children's lives, more significant maybe sometimes than their family members, unfortunately. Consistent routines and rule, consistent, consistency is a very important element in, in the development of, uh, of these skills and not only these skills. Involvement in household chores and responsibilities, the sooner the better. The research shows it is very important. Yeah, it's not necessarily our concerns as teachers, but we can recommend parents. I have noticed in my students in middle school, it is very obvious uh, that those who are not um, involved in activities that don't have responsibilities at home um, tend to be more passive, more disorganized, um, have a more disengaged attitude toward many other things. So we should expose them to situations that cultivate self-reliance as often as possible, and if needed, for some students that need extra support, tools and strategies that enhance self-awareness and autonomy, depending on how much, how much they need these yeah. tools and strategies. And what do we normally see in class? Yeah, if students are uh, have challenges with some of these executive functions, this is how the challenges present in class. Yeah? 
most uh, the mo most common. Of course, there are many behaviors that can be attributed to a weak executive function, but the most common of them are some of these. For response inhibition, acting on impulse, fidgeting, speaking out of turn, disruptive behavior in general can be attributed to this. For organization, misplacing, forgetting things, losing things, messy workspaces, or working memory, which is one of my weak. It's easier for me to spot in my students this because it's one of my weak executive functions. Difficulty remembering and following rules. Proceed and steps in procedures, uh, losing train of thought, forgetting instructions. And it's quite difficult for them to process instructions uh, when you give them, uh, uh, give the instructions only verbally. Yeah, they remember the two steps, but they forget the third, for example. As for flexibility, you can see rigid thinking patterns and difficulty changing habits, routines, or the uh, difficulty adapting to new contexts, like it happened uh, during the pandemic, for instance. As for emotional control, you can see emotional reactions out of proportion and difficulty self-regulating, difficulty accepting feedback, not taking risks unless they are uh, almost certain they can do very well, which, of course, uh, impedes them from, from doing a lot of new things. With attention, you notice easily distracted kids that they can't process multiple types of information or instructions at once, miss out details, and you know they are very good at English, they uh, write very well, but their writing is messy, their handwriting is messy in some situations, and the page looks messy too, because they focus on the content, but they can't focus so much on the form sometimes. With task initiation, difficulty getting started. I, I have students that when I give instruction, let's open the instructions, let's open the page at the, the book, sorry, at page 20, for example, and let's start doing exercise five. They just sit and look, look at me, look around. And I, it always uh, uh, puzzles me. What are you waiting for? <laughs> Is, don't you know the page? What's the problem? But it's more difficult for them to actually uh, open the book, take on the pen, and start writing. With planning and prioritizing, you see uh, students who who fail to see what's relevant for a certain situation or get stuck in minor on uh, minor details or um, they don't know what to do next. They they need more support in in. Uh, I don't know, when in um, every step of a longer task or a more complex task. Time management, obviously, students are often late, miss deadlines, don't finish tests on time. They don't have a, a very precise perception of how time passes. Goal-directed persistence, some of them get easily discouraged, have difficulties in finishing tasks, or long-term projects. And this is very important for, um, for preparing for exams or um, preparing for um, something that might take a few weeks, for example. Yeah, they don't do very well on, on these, kinds of, um, these kinds of projects or tasks. And metacognition, what you can see, difficulty self-monitoring and self-assessing not knowing when things are not going well. Um, they find it very difficult to, to see themselves objectively and to understand how do, how are, how, how the, their performance is when compared to objective criteria, for example. Yeah, it um, presents uh, difficulties for them. Of course, we all have weak, executive functions and strong ones. With enough strong executive functions, we can manage com to compensate or to use those strong executive functions and to improve the weak ones. Um, the problem is when there are many of them that are weak and the students do not receive proper support. That's when um, 
when disengagement appears, uh, they start being demotivated, that they start feeling that it's too difficult or it's too much. They can't handle the complexity of school. And this is one of the reasons that some students just at some point just give up on themselves on uh, as learners. And what I'd like you to do to write in chat is which of these um, issues, let's say difficulties, do you see more, most often in your, uh, in your students? Or which do you think contribute more to their difficulties with school in general? Mm -hmm. Yeah, being late for classes, skipping classes. Yeah, one step influences the other, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. If one happens, yes, for some students, if one happens and there's another issue and another issue. Mm -hmm. And they get more than more discouraged. Sustained attention, yeah, this is very challenging for kids nowadays, I, I believe for us too. Thank you. And there are some types of students that um, um, if you can see some, clust uh, some clusters of uh, weak executive functions, they present in a certain typologies of students, let's say. So there's the lost student. For them, everything seems to take forever because they're, they appear as messy, disorganized, they have difficulties planning, and everything takes forever. Um, I used to be in my uh, teenage years, that kind of student. It got better in time with practice. The lazy student, um, so, uh, most of the times we, we we keep asking ourselves, what, what's wrong with them? Why are they like this? Nothing seems to engage them, to interest them, no matter how fun, how interesting, how motivating, how um, the, the materials uh, personalized uh, according to their interests. There are some students uh, that um, have this air of uh, everything is very hard. You know, life in, in general feels very hard for them. It, it's a real issue for some students and the last typology the most unfortunate one i think the leaky student it's that kind of student that uh, seems angry at everyone and everyone is angry at him or her because they have a combination of uh, executive functions that makes them particularly challenging so they have uh, difficulties with response inhibition sustained attention with self-regulation they are very emotional, they have um, outbursts of emotions, and um, they are the ones that need, need more the most support. But <clears throat> many of them, are, I don't think they, um, they get the, the necessary support. Maybe because lack of information, I don't know, lack of resources in school, and they um, would benefit the most from specialized intervention, from school counseling, counselor, and so on. Most neurodivergent students have these kind of challenges, not only them, but you can see these kind of challenges uh, even uh, more um, manifesting more intensely, especially in this kind of students. And they were in my, from what I noticed during the pandemic, they were the category that um, were the most impacted by, by what happened. <clears throat> and long-term consequences Basically, we get, they, they get labeled. Yeah, we can't help you if, even if we don't use these words in relationship to them. They feel, they, they, their parents use these words um, and they get, um, they get to, to believe these things about themselves. And the problem is not only what happens in school and how this impacts their school results, is they, they carry these labels outside school, 
after they, they finish their education. And it's quite difficult for them to, to have a good, happy, productive life, yeah, to support themselves financially. Some of them don't even finish high school, for example, not to mention going to university. Now, in the, uh, the most vulnerable ones, they don't even finish their, yeah, their high school education, which I, I believe it's a pity. And of course, we can't, <clears throat> we can't find a solution for every problem they have. But what we can do is to intervene on some, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> to, to do some things that might help them develop this, um, these skills. <clears throat> sorry. First of all, what we already do. Uh, if we do classroom management, efficient classroom management, if we implement some um, um, sitting plans, expect clear expectations and consequences, routines, if we use uh, visual organizers and timetables, and if we teach them how to use these uh, time, to, how to work with a timetable, with a, a reminding a reminder system, with a visual organizer, and so on, so to actually help them use these instruments. And also, uh, we use learning platforms and we teach them how to use them too. Because on a learning platform like Google Classroom, for example, you have everything in the same place. Yeah, all it pretty much solves uh, your uh, problem with uh, organizing materials with deadlines. So if we do these kind of things that we normally do in our, in our activity, that's already a lot. And the key word here is consistency. These kids need support, structure, and consistency. And if we provide this, we already do a lot. If we provide this consistently. And uh, in our uh, subject um, teaching, I think it is very, very important to have data on our students, to have as much data as possible. I believe in numbers. Um, empirically, I can notice some things in my students, or if I, uh, after a few tests or after a few written assignments, I can have a general feeling of what's happening there or what kind of difficulties they have. But I think having um, gathering data in a more uh, structured manner is very helpful for us too. And it's very helpful when we, when we talk about this uh, kind of for, for them clear assessment criteria for them to develop self-assessing skills. They need to know what, what the criteria are, how to work with the criteria, and time for discussion and reflection, not only uh, for ourselves, as for, for our reflection as teachers, but for them too. I, th I think it is very important to, uh, to create a habit of, uh, of reflection in, in our classes. So, they are pretty much uh, general teaching principles that we follow or we try to follow as consistently as we can. They help a lot. And if you want to explore a bit more about these executive functions and how, how you can um, introduce them in your lessons, how you can, uh, I don't know, uh, tackle them in a more structured way, um, I have found a very interesting approach called the activated learning, which is basically doing exactly what we normally do in our English teaching lessons with a focus on these skills or with uh, being more deliberate on some processes or on some um, uh, on why we use certain activities, why we ask certain questions. So it's not about doing something else, a new curriculum, introducing new uh, kind of uh, activities of information. Um, that's why I, I like this approach and it makes a lot of sense for me because um, it allows a lot of flexibility. It provides a framework, provides materials and information, which are very useful, but it doesn't um, um, restrict it doesn't restrict, sorry, me, if I want to use this approach, it doesn't restrict me to a certain number of classes or hours or 
certain topics, I can go about my teaching, yeah, business as usual, but with a more deliberate uh, and, and more intentional approach. And the ingredients are making the invisible visible, meaning raising awareness of, uh, of one's behaviors, thinking processes and learning styles, helping students be more aware of, of how they think and how they learn and what happens. Yeah, what happens when you are late to school? Why are you this late to school? What exactly, let's go through the process of that. Uh, providing knowledge, uh, students would be helpful to know the vocabulary of executive function and how dots connect, how these executive functions help them or not really. And empowering, so these are the three ingredients in this approach, empowering students with tools and strategies, depending on what their needs are. Maybe they, are, they have just one as a weak executive function or as a whole group, if you want to, to work with an entire class, um, you may identify which executive function you want to focus on, what's, what seems to, to need more, more intervention. And I, I strongly recommend uh, to read the book, Executive Function Skills in the Classroom, and to go and uh, take a look at this um, website, Activated Learning. What I like about the book and the, the approach, it is based on uh, hard data, on serious research, but the information is not presented in a very theoretical and difficult to, to follow manner. Very clear, very um, hand-on, and it makes a lot of sense to me. It, it made a lot of sense to um, to apply. It seems so easy and so obvious. Uh, I asked myself, why haven't I thought of this? Or why haven't I, I done this uh, earlier? And uh, no matter how you want to approach this, to, to approach it in a more structured, long-term manner, or to give just some, to focus just on one executive function or um, for a, a shorter period of time, yeah, you can find their materials and uh, starting points, or whatever you want to do. And um, what I'd like to conclude with, because time's up, so I covered pretty much what uh, what was very what I considered essential, very important. Um, please, whatever you're doing, whatever whatever approach you are. Um, you are uh, taking on or not. Um, remember that not only our students are work in progress, we are work in progress too. And we deserve the same kindness and patience and um, grace that we usually give our students, but it is more difficult to, to give to ourselves. But please keep that in mind that we are learning, we are work in progress too. And um, we, um, it's a learning journey that we take together with our students. And here are some references and resources, but mainly if you want to tackle this executive function thing, go to the activated learning website and that's a great starting point there. Thank you very much, Mirella. Thank you very, very much for, for the very hands-on presentation that you've delivered today. Very, very useful information, which I'm sure everyone, and I'm sure everyone has something to learn from what you've just uh, presented. These are indeed challenges that we teachers face quite a lot during our, um, during our <laughs> activity or throughout our, throughout our careers. Um, this being said, um, this has been the last presentation of the free session uh, part of the conference. Thank you very much for attending everyone. You will receive certificates of participation. My colleague will now put in the chat box the feedback link which you will need to fill in in order to get the certificates. If you do not manage to fill it in right now, 
do not worry because we will we will send uh we will send an email to you guys containing the feedback form uh so that you can get your participation certificates so if you don't manage to do it now as i said don't worry you'll be able to do it once you receive uh the email but please fill it in by wednesday at 12 p.m uh we'll include that piece of information in the email as well that you need to fill it in by that time uh, on wednesday after that we will issue the the certificates and you will receive them Thank you very much to each and every one of you for your participation. I hope you've found the, the information presented useful. Uh, yeah, I see that there are a lot of uh, messages here. We thank you a lot for having spent the day with us uh, up until this point. Uh, at 2 p.m., at 2 p.m., the gold part, the gold session of the conference will begin. Those of you who uh, register for that have received the login information on your emails. Uh, thank you once again to everyone for your participation. Have a wonderful 2024 and a wonderful afternoon. Goodbye.